Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this formal meeting of Children's Services Overview and Scrutiny Committee, held in part by Microsoft Teams. Please note for this meeting of Children's Services Overview and Scrutiny Committee is being live streamed and will be recorded by the Council to support the production of the minutes for the use of democratic services. In order to ensure the meeting is managed effectively, please could everyone present follow these ground rules of speaking. Only speak when invited to by the Chair. Mute your microphone when you're not talking. If accessing by Teams only, always turn on your video function when invited to speak and state your name. Please use your microphone when speaking and please mute or turn off your microphone when you're not talking. If you'd like to speak on an item, please do by using the raise your hand feature on the bottom of the top of the Teams window. Um, before we start, I'd just like to welcome a couple of people. I'd like to uh, welcome Andy Martin, who's at first, uh, Councillor Andy Martin, who's the first time in, in this committee. Um, Andy, in Children's Services, we do tend to use our first names if you're happy with that. Um, I'd also like to put a new Democratic Services Officer coming to join us tonight, Karen. Um, you're very welcome, Karen. Um, and I'd also welcome support being offered from the LGA. Um, we've got um, Sue Turner online, I believe. Uh, welcome, Sue, um, who's going to join remotely. Yes, um, I think you're going to give us a, a brief review of, of, of what, what, what you're going to get involved with. Uh, would you like to do that now, Sue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you along this evening. Uh, I'm representing the LGA. Claire Burgess, your Children Improvement Advisor for the area, is unable to make it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we've um, we've offered some uh, support in terms of scrutiny development. The um, the local government association are running a program and creating a program of support for uh, scrutin children's scrutiny committees across the country. Um, and um, you're being a part of that, I understand. So I think at the moment you've uh, completed a self-assessment. Um, but what's uh, the, the program involves um, identifying needs with you during the self-assessment and any further conversations afterwards. Uh, we then have, uh, we, we like to run a foundation session with you just to check back and clarify so that we, any support that can be given um, is, is direct and impactful for yourselves. And then depending on the um, circumstances in our conversations, there's a couple of uh, development sessions that um, are run for um, the scrutiny committee in areas where you feel you might like to develop uh, your skills further. Um, and then we, we keep in touch and we follow up. So it's a programme um, that's been funded by the Department for Education um, and we've uh, been working to develop this so far across the country. We've worked with about four or five local authorities to test this so far. I don't know if anyone's got any questions, Councillor. Um, no, th thank you very much for that. I'll, I'll just just to reassure people, it, it was me that sort of put us forward for this, and I do hope you've all got your, the, um, um, the the paperwork that I sat around for it. Um, there will be some dates sent out to you shortly, probably tomorrow. Um, what was your up with the dates for when we're going to be running these sessions? Um, are there any questions at all from, from anybody regarding this? No, well, thank you very much, Sue. Thank you for that input. Okay, look forward to working with you. Yeah, and enjoy the meeting. Okay. Um, so, apologies. I've received a, apologies from Sandra, who's uh, um, who got the dreaded COVID, uh, but is joining us online. Um, I've got uh, uh, Councillor Dan Butt um, is also not feeling well, um, so he sent his apologies. I've also had apologies from Mark Saxby. Uh, do we have any other apologies, Liz? No, Chair. And um, do we have any substitute members? No, Chair, no substitutes. So, item three, declarations of interest. Do any councillors have any disposable pecuniary interest on any local interest matters on this agenda? No, it doesn't look like it. Let's check. Um, no, okay, thank you very much. Um, so, the minutes, um, I imagine you've all had a chance to have a look at the minutes. Are there any issues with the minutes at all? No, in that case, um, if you just give me a moment to sign them. Uh, 
But yeah, I wish talked a lot last time because there's a lot of minutes to sign. Um, so, um, public issues. Um, um, oh, yes, sorry, the um, action sheet. Yeah, there's a, there's a few um, actions still outstanding on the action sheet. Um, I, I'm hoping that we manage to tick off uh, a few of the oldest ones, actually, this meeting. Uh, and a couple of things have sort of become slightly out of date now. So we're going to take off a couple of the um, items from last year um, at the action sheet. Are there any other issues on the action sheet? No? Okay. Um, so, uh, public issues. No public issues received, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, item six is feedback from the Child Exploitation Working Group. Now, um, first off, um, I'll give you a bit of a verbal update on this. Um, thank you very much for the, the members, Eddie, um, May, Lisa and Sandra, uh, who, who were the councillors who attended, and uh, Kat and Juliet, the two officers. Um, it was really informative um, a working group actually um, I was all very struck about what we learned and found out uh, during it um, we um, and, and how complex the issues were and the in interconnections between those the experience of being exploited and becoming uh, becoming exploited later on uh, we found out about the tools being used uh, to write aid identification and the push pull factors um, that the tools identify uh, plus how workers were being trained to use this and rolled out, including the use in schools and other agencies. Uh, we discussed the work of the Safer Schools Partnership and the work of the police and age appropriate PSHE within schools. Um, and how the knowledge within friendship groups are the key to identifying possible exploitation. Uh, we also asked how the delivery of PSHE contact was being monitored. Um, uh, there was an explanation of how targeting areas and individuals show results. Uh, we noted the issues caused by um, recruitment due to pay and Ofsted and how this was being tackled. However, a small special resources complex safeguarding team is now in post. Uh, we supported the ideas on mentors to help young people make positive choices and hope to increase the use of, of youth workers. We also discussed how the, uh, the young people could also, from the, the um, youth parliament, uh, could also get involved within the school environment. Um, I'm just looking at the members of, of that working group. If anything to add to that from anybody? Yeah, uh, Eddie. How did you guess, Mr Chairman? Um, yes, thank you for that. Um, just a bit of an update. Um, I believe uh, last week or in the last 10 days, um, I heard that there was a report uh, being prepared, hopefully, to go to Parliament on um, these issues. Um, and I was just wondering, perhaps in the new year, um, I'd like to see this progress a bit further and perhaps we should be lobbying our two MPs to see whether they would support anything going further. Um, and also, uh, you know, um, I've only just had hot off the press um, something from the our local police and crime commissioner um, giving us an update, um, and um, yeah, well, we all know it's it's moving on at a fast pace, but I think we should be doing a lot more. But what we do and how we do it, I'm not too sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that input, Eddie. Um, I believe he said that he's willing to share the um, the email with um, the members. Yes, I'm, I'm happy and I'll vouch for that and I'll, because um, he's given me an update because I've been um, uh, obviously emailing him uh, and said that we were doing this working group um, on this topic and um, he's very keen and perhaps uh, perhaps in the new year that we, we'll get the Police and Crime Commissioner to come and talk to us uh, at, or, or the working group. Yeah, Thank I, you. Think, I think that'll be a really useful idea. Um, so I'll leave that you to forward to us. Um, Sandra, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, there. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I think we asked something along the lines of whether or not there were any uh, specific locations um, where the um, uh, ex sorry exploitation took place. And um, I think there was um, something along the lines that they were applying for a grant to um, get some funds to try to design out some of the problems. I know that there was um, 
um, they, they did quite a bit of work in the bus station and the other place that they mentioned was the gardens, but they were applying for a grant, I believe. And I think we ought to follow that through, if that's OK. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think that's it's also OK and a good idea. Um, looking at anybody else on the... Uh, the yes. Um, they just be clear because you, you weren't part of the, the committee, but uh, I still welcome your, your hearing from Yes, thank you, Chair. I just, in the interest of me, uh, obviously my first meeting, so getting a bit more of a, an overview of, of, um, the, of some of these issues. First of all, could you give me a, a sort of a brief overview of the scale of the problem in our area? Um, and secondly, are we uh, working on liaising with Dorset Council um, on the issue? Thank you. Yeah, I, yes, we, we can send you a, a, some, some notes on, on that, if that would be helpful. Yeah, um, the, the, the notes from the, um, the committee will be circulated um, also very soon, probably tomorrow. Um, we've seen them in a draft form, um, but they'll be going out to the whole of the members of, of the committee later. Okay. Um, just looking at the possible um, actions to be considered from that, um, I've got a few bullet points here. Um, so we request an update so the tools being used by the MASH um, as an appropriate time following. Um, invite police to brief a committee on work done to, for safer schools. So, so maybe that might fit in with what, what you're involved with there, Eddie. Um, invite uh, Kelly Twishan to brief the committee on work done within schools regarding exportation being taught in PSHE and how it is monitored because that was uh, something it was interested in. Um, speak to Sarah Rampal regarding the work um, to do in schools around CE. Um, possible invite youth service officer to discuss the work done um, by the youth bus and see how the, the NYPs can assist in their school environment. So there, there are a few possibilities. Now, what, what I'll do is rather than just debating that right now, um, what I, I will I'll send that list out by email, in fact, um, and if people would like to think about it and email me with their thoughts, um, we're all happy with that. Okay, thanks very much. Um, moves on then to um, item seven, the Pandorf Safeguarding Children's Partnership. So this is here to enable the committee to monitor this issue when target scrutiny is required. It was delayed from September. Um, so just a reminder, this is the Pan Dorset report, and it knows so it's what we need to, so it does cover both BCP and Dorset, but we do need to focus on BCP part issues on, on this report, um, where we can make a difference. Um, I'd like to welcome James Vaughan, the Pan Dorset Safeguarding Children Partnership Chair, to present the report. I, I think I saw you there. Yeah. Good evening, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Um, hey. Thank you. Um, good evening, and... Uh, to colleagues and other members. Um, yes, I'm James Vaughan. I'm the um, independent chair of the Pan Dorset Children's Safeguarding Partnership. Um, we, we were convened in, tw in 2019 um, in accordance with Working to Together to Safeguard Children, the 2018 iteration, um, a, a strategic body made up of three statutory agencies but of course um, local authorities being one of those is split in two across our two large so we are a pan dorset partnership um, i'm obliged um, in statute to publish an annual report the the annual report is attached um, as an appendices to your paper um, the report is a, a, a combined effort from the four different agencies that, that make up the partnership. We, we work together to, to produce an annual report, but the, I'm a, technically the, the author. So that's why it's here. That sets out our, our role. It sets out our strategic priorities for the year um, and the key areas of focus. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, I'm sure most of you you, you are that uh, we have the strategic pan dorset partnership which is our statutory partnership and then we have place-based arrangements where much of the detailed delivery work is done and, and, and you, as you know um, that's arranged in bcp uh, it's referred to in this report as the um, the area safeguarding committee but i know that there's been a name change which will appear in, in future in future reports 
So the key sort of areas of responsibility for the Pan Dorset partnership is to look at learning in practice, um, the commissioning of local all case audits and local um, children's um, safeguard and practice reviews and local reviews. It's to um, ensure that we we contribute to the child death overview process, the overview panels to examine and review every child death that occurs in our county area, including BCP, and to also look and oversee, coordinate and ensure that we have a good training, uh, multi-agency safeguarding training function. So those are our key areas. We have four priorities that we've developed. Um, We've, de we've developed those in line working with the community safety partnerships and the, the Safeguard and Adults boards. Um, and those four um, priorities are laid out in the report, but in, in essence, they are exploitation of children. They are sexual abuse. They are looking at the impact of domestic abuse on children's safeguarding and the following COVID in particular, sort of monitoring health and well-being and mental health and well-being of children are the four sort of key areas of focus for us. The um, so what I don't intend to do is go through each it, the report line by line. This the report is here for you to note um, and endorse uh, as a, one of the statutory partners and it's here for scrutiny and questions um, which I'm very happy chair to, to take um, probably as a double act with the director of children and services. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, that presentation. Um, first off I'd, I'd like to say I did like the, the glossary uh, up front. Um, it's one of the things in, in, in children and services that, that we're very keen on and it, it was very helpful. It made reading the acronyms and things a, a lot easier. Um, I've got a couple of questions, uh, well, one particular question, but, but I'm just going to look around for, for the members of, of the committee to see whether anybody else would like to start on this one. Yeah, yeah. Eddie. Well, uh, endorse the, the, the report, very good. Uh, obviously, you, 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 you touched on um, child exploitation again, which is um, quite prominent in the report um, and just uh, a couple of items that um, I picked up was the criminal exploitation basic awareness and the Carroll group so you are doing stuff and working with partners uh, as well as the Dorset uh, police impact team on county lines so um, I fully support what you're doing and hopefully this committee um, can support anything further on the safeguarding on those issues will be um, will take on board hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and anybody else uh, got any any questions, May? Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, James. Um, good evening, I'm Chair. I'm just really um, a direct question, probably more for yourself. Um, in the report at the start, I, I, I think when you were appointed as the new chair, they said they added scrutiny to the title. So I just wanted to understand a bit further with the scrutiny, who do you actually report and who do you actually challenge and how is it monitored if you were to challenge something? And I'll just get all the questions in at the same time. And obviously, Eddie has just mentioned that we had a uh, child exploitation working group, which is ongoing. And it's an area that's of great concern to us here as, as a committee. So I guess my question leading on from that is that if we had any particular issues, is this something that we might actually be able to feed into you as part of your scrutiny process? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and uh, good evening, Councillor Haynes. Good. Um, so the 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 name of scrutineer is added to this independent chair's role um, at the end of last year. Um, we've worked. We've taken some time this year to try to understand what that means. Um, many of you will know that scrutiny in partnerships is something that people are, are scratching their heads around all over the country and the sort of the task, but which is the, uh, the, the association 
uh, that, that we, we use uh, have, have done a, a piece of work this year to try to understand what are the best scrutiny arrangements uh, around. And, we, and we've looked at that report and we'll take that on board. Um, so uh, it's, to, to be really frank, we haven't really given, we, we've given scrutiny a lot of thought. We've done some scrutiny this year and we are building a scrutiny plan going into next year, which of course uh, we'll publish and let you see. But I'll give you an example of the kind of things that we are doing for scrutiny. Um, as the chair and the executive, we 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 oversee sign off or commission oversee sign off and then uh, and then evaluate all the the reviews that the, the local safeguarding the children's safeguarding practice reviews and other audits and reviews. That's that's a really key part of the role. Um, we do we 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 look at strategic risk management, emerging threats, emerging risk. Um, and scrutinise those. We've just finished um, a what what they call a section eleven audit, which is which is scrutiny of each each other, both the statutory partners and the non-statutory partners. We where we provide scrutiny to each other around our own children's safeguarding arrangements under section eleven of the Children's Act. So that's an area of scrutiny, and we found uh, that was a useful exercise, um, both for the statutory partners, but um, in particular, some of the non-statutory partners who were struggling with understanding their responsibilities under Section 11, I think, have found that useful, and we've done some careful work there. Um, we've done some scrutiny of ourselves. We put the um, business management function, the budget of the um, partnership under review at the start of the year to make sure that we were providing value for money and offering a, a model that was in line with the best practice nationally and broadly we were good value. We've made some tweaks to the budget. Um, Police and Crime Commission has agreed to level up his contribution so that all four of the statutory partners on our partnership pay the same every year. That wasn't the case before. It was done based on the size of organisation and budgets. So that's a, a good thing. Um, and we've agreed and we've just appointed a single business manager across the two local authority areas to provide some better consistency and some efficiency. Um, but we are um, may working hard to develop a full scrutiny plan, which may well include um, emerging threats and themes such as exploitation, such as unaccompanied asylum seekers uh, at risk of harm, such as um, mental ill health in, in children in, uh, in schools, etc. So um, I hope that answers your question to, to some degree, but it's very much a work in progress and a focus to be for a published plan next year. Thank you very much, James. May, do you want to follow us? Um, no, I have nothing further to add, Chair, other than to uh, thank James and look forward to actually seeing the scrutiny plan when it's actually drawn up. Thank you. Right. Yes, thank you. Um, just following on from... Oh, just wait till they turn their... Um... Thank you. Okay, so there's a bit of, bit of feedback there. Uh, we'll just wait a moment. Try again. Oh, no. I think we're working all right now. Yes. Um, I, sorry, sorry for the bit of a technical delay there. Um, there's sort of something that was hinted on um, the, the working across organisations, uh, Dorset and BCP. Um, can, can, can I ask um, how, how is that going? It, it, does it work working across uh, two large organisations like BCP and, and Dorset? It, it's certainly challenging because we are two very large um, unitary. Um, 
and we, the executive works hard to try and ensure that we we look at things on a pan Dorset basis and where we should work together on things like reviews, training, child death, we absolutely do. Where where we can where we can leave um, place based matters in place, um, we do that well. There is always a question and and around where the statutory board should sit should that sit in a pan dorset environment or should that be two um statutory partnerships uh, effectively what is being delivered in the place base and that's an ongoing discussion strategic discussion both as a as a, an executive there's quite a mature discussion about it i've always said that i'm completely agnostic to it as long as 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 long as what we have works for everybody um it's to be honest. We've, we're three years in. We've we do spend quite a bit of our time looking, re-examining structure. I'm sure there there is a conversation moving forward over the coming months to to re-examine to make sure that the partnership arrangements, both in Pan Dorset and at Place Base, are absolutely working for for children in the BCP area. And your director will 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 guide you through that over over coming weeks and months. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think Cathy did indicate to, to follow up with that. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, James. You're absolutely right. It, it's been a discussion that we've been having. Uh, the um, Overview and Scrutiny Committee will note that in John Coughlin's DFB letter to the Secretary of State, which is part of your pack, actually has a section about the safeguarding partnership and makes a suggestion about that discussion uh, becoming more live and, and further. I think there are things uh, that we need to consider. The, uh, the, statutory direct, uh, the statutory responsibility for safeguarding sits with the DCS role. Um, that uh, it, we need to consider what the DfE advisor has written in that uh, letter. But equally, the work that the partnership has done at an executive level does not need to get lost in some of that discussion. Uh, and so there may be a different delivery model that we have to um, that we may want to consider um, going forward. But we do not need to lose that um, across the Dorset area, um, uh, sort of that work together with our partners. Yep. So thank you very much, because I was actually going to um, quote one line from from, from that, but which I don't. I'm sure you know which line I'm going to to quote. It says, I, "I'm not going to." So far as go you know, so, so far as to direct the establishment of a co-terminus partnership yet. Um, to go that's what, what it, it says. Um, although I do totally agree, not throwing out the good work that's already gone on. Um, it, it's it's the yet bit which I was sort of honing in on. Thank you, Chair. I think there has been a, a, a real concerted effort. Um, in building some really strengthening partnerships across that uh, Pan Dorset safeguarding partnership. It's not something I think any of us would want to step away from lightly. And so it's how do we retain those really good and positive relationships whilst considering whether does it still meet uh, the safeguarding responsibilities for BCP. Um, and so it, it is in discussion. Um, and has been, as James indicated, in discussion prior to um, the DfE advisor's uh, letter. And so he will be considering our actions in that area. It might be, if we put a convincing case forward that we wanted to retain the Pan Dorset area, then he would, he would accept that. It could be that we decide that we want to do something different. And we haven't come to that conclusion yet, but it is a live discussion, as James says. So thank you very much. I think it'll be very interesting to, to, to keep a tab on that input, um, just so we know what's going on. Um, I'm looking around. Any other members of the committee got some? Two more, three, Richard. Yes, of course. Sure. Yes, for sure. Hi, for you, Chad. Oh, James, good to see you. Um, I was just wondering how the partnership interlinks with um, sports organisations and clubs and volunteer groups. Does that cover your remit at all? Um, not, not directly through the partnership, but certainly. Uh, agencies that, that make up the partnership uh, do a lot with that. We don't have a, a work stream as such, and not that we shouldn't. I'm very happy to look at that, but not not currently. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Sir James. Okay. Thank you. I'm just looking around. Oh, May. Uh, thank you, James. My second by the chair. And if anyone else wants to go, no. 
Okay. I, I don't think I've, I've given everybody else a chance today, so... Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to barge in there again with another question. So, um, looking at, on our agenda, page 69, which is actually the top of page ooh, 39 of the, the main glossy report, it talks about funding for um, outreach youth workers, which I think is, is a good thing. But the bit that concerns me is that it says the funding has been accessed from the COVID recovery fund. So the question that comes to mind is that COVID recovery fund is a one-off. It's not ongoing. So where does that lead for the future? Uh, does that mean that we will have to have less outreach workers or would there be a different strategy as to how we would actually deal with it? Because sometimes I think we know from other um, scrutiny items that we've looked at that actually what really helps is that continuity of contact. So just wondering what will happen in the future when there is no longer the funding available for extra youth outreach workers. Are you able to um, answer that at all, James? Yeah, I'm not sure that's the question I can answer. Um, that's a local operational um, delivery issue to me. Cathy, I don't know whether you're able to help. Okay, can you any input for that one, Cathy? Yeah, I know that uh, comp is called comp funding, uh, and uh, that was used to bolster um, some work around supporting children and young people who we may have not had sight of, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who may have um, been particularly uh, affected by COVID-19. Uh, what we would always do in those circumstances is we would look to sustainability and whether there was a requirement for us to still supply that. Um, this is um, in terms of the Dorset Child Exploitation Strategic Group that are obviously having that, that discussion. Uh, we wouldn't want to make arrangements that were, would take away some good, some good work from children and young people. And so I would say the work, the, the work will be is to consider whether we can continue that and how we would fund it. Does that answer your question, okay, mate? Okay. Thank you. In that case, I... Yeah, yeah of course, Dylan. It's a... Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to make a slight comment. We um, we put the agenda items forward uh, to a youth forum, uh, BCP's youth forum for young people, um, and we got a, got a little bit of um, responses saying that they weren't too too aware of what Pandors it was, uh, the Pandors that Safeguarding Partnership was. Um, now, I know, you know, safeguarding is a thing that um, is often perceived as, you know, something that the adults do for us. But I think it is interesting that uh, the young people that are directly affected by it sometimes don't even know what it is. Uh, we had one, uh, one young person that was a, um, that has uh, had interactions with it. Just thought it was quite interesting that um, they didn't know. And if there was any work that um, Pandors do do to, um, you know, uh, have, have young people aware of what it is. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not very sure. happy to, I'm very yes, happy to respond to that, Chair, if I could. Yeah, that, that would be really helpful. I think their feedback, um, lots of groups and boards, um, strategic bodies, um, in good faith do good work, but often um, people in the public don't really know who they are, what they do. Um, and so I take that feedback completely on board from you, Dylan. I think it's a, an excellent um, challenge. Um, what I propose and would offer is I'm, I'm very, very happy, both personally as the chair of the Pandorset um, Safeguarding Partnership and for the business management team to make ourselves available to you, either to come and meet you, meet your, your group, uh, or provide you with a presentation um, to try and to help you understand what we do and what we do for children um, it, across the two areas, um, including BCP. If that's an offer you would like to take up, we can do the, the, the admin in detail offline. Yeah, you find that helpful, didn't yeah, no, that's great, actually. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely take, take them up on it if that's all right. Thank you, James. Right, thank you. In that case, um, looking around, I, I think um, we, we've discussed this quite enough, just to, to sum up. Um, we, we started talking about exploitation and how um, that this sort of fed into the, the, the work that we've been doing. Um, we've had quite a discussion about the scrutiny, who scrutinises, and, and the addition to scrutiny to, to the Pan Dorset Safeguarding Partnership. Um, we've uh, and, and the plan that you're developing for that. Um, 
where we talked about the, the, the issues and advantages of working with Pan Dorset uh, and, and how we can um, keep the advantages without um, uh, having so many issues, shall we say. Um, we've talked about the funding for the outreach youth workers. Uh, as we've talked about the possibility of sports organisations and if there's any uh, input from them. Um, and the young people um, making sure that they understand and know it's happening. Um, in that case, we'll go to uh, item eight, the Children's Services Improvement Plan. Well, this is one of our uh, outstanding items. Uh, we've just received the public report uh, of the recent offset monitoring visit on the 8th of November, uh, so it's very timely for this meeting. So I welcome Rachel Gavitt, uh, Director of Quality Performance Improvement and Governance, to present the report. You're welcome, Rachel. Who's going to do the, uh, the talking? Okay. The report, and then um, I'll do a little bit. Right. Unfortunately, it's just been Let's just take time because I know we're all having IT issues today. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yes, so just check everybody can see that. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's really silly. You're asking that. It's in the room, isn't it? Um, everybody online can see it. We're looking like they can online. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. As, as uh, Rachel has said, Rachel will be pressing the buttons, hopefully, while I'll, I'll take it through. But uh, there are other members of the team who are on the on screen who can help us as we get as we go along. This is a presentation from the two reports that are in your pack. We just pause a moment better? while we just sort out the technical bits. That work? It is in the pan. So uh, what I'll add to that, um, it doesn't seem to be coming through to the live stream, although it's available in the pack, which is available online, which is attached to this particular meeting. So if anybody is in the future watching this um, or watching it live, if you can refer to the pack, that would be helpful. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is um, the, a feedback regarding the second Ofsted monitoring visit. Um, and I'll cover that first and then followed by the DfE advisor's first report to the Secretary of State. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, just thinking about the journey so far of us moving from inadequate, uh, there are a number of areas that, um, that, that we've gone through. We have the statutory direction and the appointment of a DfE advisor, John Coughlin. We've got to the point now, we're about six, eight months down the line of that, that process. Uh, and John has now sent his report that you've got attached to the Secretary of State that we'll go through. Uh, we have a number of monitoring visits from that statutory direction. So they basically come and do a deep dive every 12 weeks or so. And so they call those monitoring visits. We have now had our second monitoring visit, which we have published. Um, we also have a Children's Services Improvement Board, which monitors on a monthly basis the progress and the data that we, um, we pro provide and also our performance. We also have a SEND Improvement Board to remind everybody that we do also have a written statement of action with regard to our SEND um, uh, Education Department. We have improvement plans for both the Children's Social Care and SEND 
uh, and we um, are managed through the Improvement Board and the Ascend Improvement Board against those plans. We also have a sector-led improvement programme and our partner for that is uh, Hampshire County Council for uh, Children's Services and Bedford Council for the Written Statement of Action and the SEND work. Just wanted to remind you on the right hand side of this slide, the inspection regime that we are now under um, and it takes a great team effort to, to get there. Uh, so we've had um, a number of focus visits in 2019, 2020. Um, we have an annual conversation with Ofsted who, who want us to talk about our self-assessment and that happened in April 2021 and May 22. We'll all recall the SEND inspection and the ILAC, so I won't re-rehearse those. But more recently, for, for, uh, June, we had our first monitoring visit and then in October, we had our second monitoring visit and we also had the Youth Justice Service HMI uh, visit uh, inspection. Uh, we've had the draft report of that Youth Justice Service, which is not publishable until January. So again, we can bring that here if overview and scrutiny would like to see that. Um, I will say that to manage two inspections during October, we actually had 10 inspectors on our premises at one point during that inspection. So that was incredibly heavy. But I would actually say the team stood up to that extremely well. I'm not sure again, uh, but we don't seem to have any coordination between the Youth Justice Service and Ofsted to have managed that timing, but uh, we managed it. Okay, so this time that uh, the monitoring visit from Ofsted, uh, it was about children and needs and those subject to a child protection plan. So they go into a quite a deep dive um, and they cover particular areas. Uh, so quality of practice, the timeliness of our social work intervention, the impact of our quality assurance processes, and what our management oversight is and our impact of that management oversight. They also look at workforce stability, recruitment and retention. And I think you'll all recognise those as topics from the ILAC and areas of, of concern. We go to the next slide. So just in terms of the headline findings, they found that there was a concerted effort to put things right and put the structures in place to make the improvements that are necessary. They felt that children's services senior management team really understand the areas for improvement and there is corporate support to continue under the kind of financial pressures. They felt that they saw more timely decisions and actions and there was a sustainable and sensible plan in place, place to provide better quality services for children. They felt that there was more steady progress and that they, we were where they expected us to be at this stage, which I think was a really good uh, uh, line in the ground for us. They felt the quality of social work is improving, which is absolutely good to hear. However, there's more to do before children receive consistently good services. They found through their conversations with staff that their staff were increasingly more confident and, and more confident about tackling risk. Staff turnover is still high, but they noted the quality of social work from temporary staff is, uh, is equally evident that it's getting better. They did find that some children experienced some delays um, and there's a bit of an absence of how we do things around here, which leads to inconsistent decision making. So what is it, the, the kind of structure and process or what is it how we'd like people to do things? They also found that some of the uh, historical legacy issues of local government review were still having an impact on the improvements, systems and working practices that I'll go into more detail. In terms of leadership and culture, I'm not going to re rehearse some of those uh, headlines that I've just given you. Uh, they felt that staff were reporting feeling well supported and staff morale is palpably on the up, which is great to hear. Uh, staff felt there was good levels of support and training uh, in line with their experience, development and interests. And they felt that staff were beginning to talk as BCP as one organisation because we did be, um, have um, uh, some staff who were aligned to particular areas, but they felt that that was changing and that, that culture was shifting. They felt there was more manageable caseloads. There were quite high caseloads, if you remember from the ILACs, um, and that enables some good social work to, social work to happen. They like the specialist services like our um, complex safeguarding um, uh, teams uh, and they felt that 
areas for de development in this area was our recruitment and retention, and that relates to uh, the pay and reward that we've all seen, uh, and the fact that we don't have a one case management system, which is not impact and ongoing issue from LGR. Um, and other areas from LGL and the structures and the target operating model that haven't, haven't finished. In terms of children in need, the key um, subject, children need those subject to child protection. They felt that the key strengths were there was pockets of more consistent social work, increased management oversight and growing staff confidence, which was leading to positive outcomes for children. Examples of uh, tackling risk and showing, and that showed a step in the right direction. They reported that children, know, that staff know their children really well and could speak um, about their children and their children's needs. Professional curiosity is developing alongside more creative thinking about how we how we solve things and how we support families. They felt we were um, managing unannounced and announced visits and they were taking place. And they felt thresholds largely were found to be applied appropriately. And if we recall, that was one of the things in, in the December that was that was quite concerning, especially around the assess risk to unborn babies and the response. And they felt that that was now better and we were uh, the way we work was being embedded. Uh, they felt children were supported at the right level of need and degree of risk. Some progress was seen complying with the statutory guidance on child protection for children. Child protection inquiries and strategies discussions taking place as and when needed. Child protection plans uh, and core groups were happening and, um, at the right time and children were seen more regularly. And that performance management is improving so we know when we're, we're meeting our targets and, and not. The quality assurance framework of the last visit was underdeveloped. We were on our starting blocks and they felt that was now embedded and that staff actually were enjoying some of the ch challenges through audits or PLRs as we call them, but they felt that they were widely valued. They felt need uh, the areas for further development with more to do on some of the caseloads, some areas still slightly high, more, more work on quality and depth social work, so more consistency um, and not and so pockets of some poorer social work against pockets of really good social work. Um, they felt ch children in need who are not subject to a child protection plan, our assessment reviews and visiting is needed to improve. Um, our assessments of children and families are not always routinely updated and that, that, that needs to be completed and our chronologies are uh, completed and need to be meaningful. Management oversight can lack focus on how children are affected, so very more for functionary rather than actually seeking impact and outcome for children. And child protection conference decisions are inconsistent. Uh, where it is done well, a more rapid progress is seen for children and families. They felt the voices and the feelings of children and young people is uh, in, improving on how this is captured in our visits, reviews, by children attending conferences and also uh, advocacy and they felt the, child, the voice of the child is helping to shape plans for them. And they felt there was improvement by social workers engaging, in the child, engaging with children and young people to uh, share their stories. So the final slide here was just that we will continue to promote the continuous learning and development and improvement and um, practice through strengthening our practice. We will always develop and champion a culture where everyone takes accountability, high support, high praise, and we will listen to our children and families for their views to inform delivery and understand the impact and their lived experience. And we always think about having optimism for ourselves, but also children and young people that we work with. I'm going to stop there. That's the monitoring visit uh, for any questions. Thank you very much for that, that input. Um, and I, it is a fascinating report. And, and you can see there's lots of progress and things happening. Um, it's, it's our job to, to have a look at a few things that we want to, to ask questions on. Um, if, if I start, because I've got a, another question here, what, what I'll do is I'll do a sort of, I'll, I'll ask one and see if anybody else wants to ask one and, and, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, I mean, you mentioned um, uh, LGR um, and, and, and the effects. Um, on page 82, the impact of local government reorganisation has been and continues to be a challenge. Um, it, it says there, and you also mentioned LGR in, in the IT systems. 
Um, now, it, it seems that there has been some progress. Um, two, two questions on this. Um, it says that there are some barriers. Um, some have been removed. W what barriers are we still have to remove? And um, how are we going to do that? Um, and, and, and one the question on the IT, are we still talking about, um, the, 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 is it the mosaic system? Um, because I know we've, we've talked about, I remember the, the first meeting I chaired of children's services back three years ago, that was talked about then um, as, as an issue. And now I know that was way before your time, so, so you know, I'm not expecting you to remember that meeting or even have to look at it. Um, but it seems to be a recurrent uh, problem which, which it, seems, it seems such a shame it's not been sorted um, so, so it, it's two slightly different questions but on, on the same thing if you see what I mean. Okay, thank you thank you chair um, I think um, it's very easy when we think about children's services uh, moving from inadequate and the rating we have from Ofsted uh, in isolation to the impact uh, that sit uh, the impact of children's services and where it sits within the in the, the, the corporateness of the council. And so if we think about mosaic, mosaic is, a, um, is that we need to move to that um, IT system, but it's not just us, it's also adults. And so it's a huge piece of work. It's a massive piece of work. Um, and obviously that impacts on children's because we need one case system rather, two, rather than two or three, because the margin of error of not picking things up through, through that system. So that has still not been resol resolved through local government review. And there are some other areas. So as local government review moves towards the target operating model uh, for how the council wants to establish itself, there is always that question about whether it's moving at the right pace for children's services and whether it's actually uh, um, working towards prioritising children as part of that whole corporate strategy. So there is a lot of work that I do with my corporate colleagues to discuss that with them and to look at how we can we can manage that at, at pace. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. Um, Lisa, yes. Um, I noticed there's a couple of mentions of a children's trust and I wondered if you could expand on what that is. Thank you. Ab absolutely. <clears throat> so the statutory direction uh, for, uh, um, by the DfE is regarding the fact that whether children's services will be able to prosper and um, improve whilst it sits within BCP Council and whether BCP Council uh, is able to give the support to children's services to enable it to thrive. The DfE advisor, he's an advisor at this moment in time, his role can change to a com commissioner. Uh, his role may change to a commissioner if he feels that uh, the BCP Council is not able to support children to enable it to, to flourish. Um, if he turns into a commissioner to, to make uh, to, to consider the position in which children sit and whether it should remain in the county in the council's uh, uh, management and oversight or whether it's spun out into a children's trust. And so, therefore, it sits outside of the council's room. Um, but um, all of the same issues would still exist, I, I imagine. Or, or is, is it just that then a decision for instance, has to be made about the computer system? And yeah. So, so if, like it, if it went out into a trust, it would mean it would have its own chief exec, it would have its own HR department, it would have its own training department, and so it wouldn't... Uh, have those dependencies on the council to manage itself and so we would be dividing all those services up so that they go into that trust as an independent uh, entity which is at arm's length from the council. Okay. Lisa, that, that answer your question okay Lisa? Yeah. This is what, I mean to be honest, this report I feel we could talk about for ages and I imagine we will do in one way or another but um, um, Peter I think uh, so, um, sorry uh, Andy Andy um, you, you were yes thank you chair um, it's, it's interesting and heartening to read um, from the executive summary about uh, uh, overarching picture and, and uh, cautious grounds for optimism so that that's really encouraging um, I wanted to pick up on the LGR issue I mean bringing the three councils together was always going to be an issue, a huge issue. 
uh, even more so, I guess, with the pandemic uh, and all the other challenges. Um, given the, this, I guess, slightly worrying answer you gave earlier on about the systems, which doesn't seem to be moving along uh, in any sense quickly, um, and it, without necessarily asking you to get out a crystal ball, um, when do you think the legacy issues will have worked their way through the system? Um, and are we looking at two years, three years, five years? Have you any idea any, or any, any sense? Yeah. That, that, in some ways, that's difficult for me to say because some of those are not within my control or understanding. There is a very big um, corporate transformation uh, structure and, and board. Um, from a children's point of view, there's a transformation children's board. Uh, and so we're very clear of the work that needs to happen. It's how we manage that interface between the two and how we support each other. One, to help the corporate centre to deliver its um, uh, priorities, but also have the corporate centre assist children in delivering their priorities. So, for instance, there's been a lot of work over the last couple of weeks about Mosaic, the one, the one um, system. Um, and it is sometimes things are unpredictable. And so we had a date of November, but you do testing. And then the right before you could you can leap to a go live, something happens within the testing. You may discover you can't pay 200 people. And so, of course, you're not going to go live. You're going to stop, reevaluate, and, and then set another day and set, set some different testing. And so some things with a good win, wind and the best will still may not happen. And so we have to support our colleagues and have to work that through the system and be open and honest and transparent about how easy or not some of these things are. Yeah, thank you. That, that was interesting because I imagine you imagine a, a, a date and a day was going to be given there for that answer. And it was, a, it's funny because I asked the, the original chip, um, um, children's services um, to, to write it down. I put it in my pocket here. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show it you later. Um, <laughs> um, Sandra, I think uh, you were next. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chair. My question was actually about um, the uh, LGR legacies as well. Um, and it was about um, ongoing HR problems. And I read somewhere in the report, I think, um, about a financial support system is needed. Are there any more details on that, please? Um, in, in terms of um, HR, uh, there are, um, you know, uh, operating models uh, that are being developed. Um, there are, um, in terms of the pay and reward, we've now managed that to work that through the system for um, children's social care, which we hope will be delivered by January. Um, with regard to, sorry, Sandra, what was your second part of that question? Um, yeah, I think I read somewhere in the report that a, a financial support systems needed. I didn't know yeah. what that was. I thought perhaps you might. <laughs> yeah, in 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 terms of in terms of us understanding uh, our expenditure, but also in terms of some of the transformation funding. Uh, that as we go forward, it's about how we support our service to transform. And so those things are being discussed at the moment, aren't they, in terms of um, the finances going forward? Does that uh, answer your, your question, Sandra? Yeah, well, I've still got a voice. Yes, thanks. <laughs> well, 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 thank you for using the remains of your voice for this yeah. meeting. Well, we very much appreciate it. Um, I, I've got a, a question about, about the financial bit, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll come to you first, Lisa. First. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, on, on page um, 83, um, we read about how there's um, social workers with only just about managing managing the, the numbers of children. Um, are, are, is there an increase in in children at risk because of this. And um, I know we've, we've been hearing over the time that we're having to depend a lot on agency staff. And, you know, it's good for children to have a regular social worker that really knows them. Um, can you sort of update us on what's going on in this area, please? Thanks. Uh, absolutely. Just to say, Ofsted did not find any children at risk. 
um, and what Ofsted did find and what they will say nationally is if a social worker's caseload is, a, is what they would term unmanageable, then the question is, is whether we are meeting children's needs in a timely manner. Uh, in the majority, they found that caseloads were manageable, but there were certain workers who had slightly um, higher caseloads, which is an issue in terms of how we support and manage our social workers. Agency social workers, we still have agency social workers. Um, the, the social work workforce uh, is, is a national issue because there isn't enough social workers. And a lot of social workers now have chosen to uh, work as agency. What we have done, in, and, and I guess because we're moving from an inadequate, we're all pulling at the same tablecloth for social workers for good and outstanding local authorities. So what is it that we can make ourselves attractive for um, social workers to come and, come and work for us? One of the things we needed to do was to ensure that our uh, pay and reward was of a similar uh, it, um, kind to our neighbours. And it, and it hasn't been because of the local government uh, review uh, and pay and reward was not going to be completed till 2024. Uh, we have worked very closely with uh, Cabinet and the Council to ensure that children's social care will be uh, managing that earlier and we're looking to see that, that come to fruition in, in January. At that point, we will also do a, um, a large recruitment campaign with the social work, uh, lo the, the magazine Social Workers Read, which is community care, um, and put ourselves out there because we've become quite competitive with, with our, with our neighbours. Uh, there are social workers who, who, who um, absolutely will come and work for BCP, but we've got to make it attractive for them to do that. We've also got to um, support those social workers who work for us who um, have been doing an extremely good job under very, very difficult conditions. And it's about how we retain our social workers and how we support them. Um, I think the management of caseloads and the reduction has gone a long way, not only to retain some of our social workers, but some of our agency workers have also, they are staying longer. But also as we go into that recruitment and retention period of time, the question is, are there agency workers that we can convince to come and convert to be permanent and to start? So it, that's a bit of a long answer to say there's a lot of work behind the scenes to try, to try and address that. But I would say it's a national issue. It's not just the BCQ issue. Thanks. That's really helpful. So would you say that morale was kind of on the way up with the social workers in general? Um, Ofsted uh, spoke to a range of social workers and workers and they have in their report said that they um, found that staff morale was probably up. So, yes, there's more to do in that area, as there always is. That's great, thanks. Thank you very much for that. Um, May, yes. Um, th thank you, Chair. I think the word I want to focus on is consistency. Because in the letter, there's talk about inconsistencies. And I think from about the, towards the end of page 83, I think, Kathy, you actually mentioned this yourself, that the, the that assessments of children not routinely updated, uh, particularly when they move around. Uh, and also then it talks about uh, towards the end of the page that we are still tending to emphasise on action and tasks rather than impact and change. And by that, I mean probably they're talking positive outcomes there, which is a, a, a concern. However, it then this goes on to say that there are um, examples of some very good practices where things have actually progressed and there's been good outcomes. So my question is, how are we pulling all this together so that we have the learning that can then um, allow this section of the service to actually progress, but progress in a positive, on a positive note? Um, and that, that's a really good question, because I think one of the uh, one of the challenges is always getting consistent social work. So there are several things that we, we can do in that area is that we um, we have our quality assurance board. And so we are beginning to evaluate all our social workers' work 
um, against the uh, offset ratings of uh, inadequate requires improvement, good or outstanding. And so we have that conversation with them. Um, um, we we also um, when we talk when um, sorry lost my train of thought there. Uh, so so good and outstanding. Um, we also need a social work model. So, so it's a bit like asking people to, to, to do a job but not really giving them some, this is the way we work around here. And I think that's actually put in, in the, one of the reports. And so we do have a social work model that we would like to uh, adopt. What we've done is ask the DFE for some funding to help us do that because it will take us um, at least two to three years to embed that. But what we have to remember is that we cannot embed something like that while we have a workforce that's continually moving and changing. Because as soon as we've given that advice or guidance to an agency worker who then goes and works somewhere else. So we need to stabilize the workforce. And as we stabilize the workforce, we will then put in a, a preferred social work model. And we have discussed that with um, the service and the teams, and they have um, come up with the model that they would like us to, to go to. And that has been signed off by my senior leadership team so we're ready in the starting gates to, to do that, but we do need to stabilise the social work team. Um, there is a lot of um, really good training. Uh, there is, we do have a really good training offer, and I think our sector-led improvement partners would, would agree it's good training. Some of our challenges is supporting and enabling social workers to attend it, uh, and, that, and that is something that we need to ensure. Um, Oh, thank you very much for that, um, Cathy, because my follow-up question was whether this was in some way linked to recruitment and retention. <laughs> You've actually answered that, yes, in part, it, it, it is. Um, it's, it's From your response, um, it's, it's good that we are actually trying to pull it all together, but I see that actually because you've got... There are so many different strands. You've got LGR, you've got the um, pay and reward strategy, and there was something else which has now escaped my mind. Um, and I think that you are facing really an enormous, an enormous challenge. But I think it's, it's really encouraging to hear that you have developed a strategy and, and a plan and, and a framework so that it would then start to perhaps uh, put in place more consistent working practices. So we can kind of look forward to the next report to see where we are with that. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you for the question and, and, and the answer. Yeah, I, I guess it's, it's again really interesting what, we, what we're seeing here. I've got a couple of questions which, which I'll give people time to have another thing first. Um, going through it sort of in sort of page order, um, page 87, uh, there are a number of substantial barriers to improvement in BCP, several which are external. Um, so I'm just wondering about these external barriers and, and what we can do. External barriers are always a lot more difficult to deal with. Um, and, and yeah, what, what, what are they and, and what help is required here? So, so some of those external barriers will be national issues, su such as the workforce. Uh, some of those barriers may be about how, how our partners uh, develop their services. So we've got the ICS and how they can su support us. Uh, there are barriers in terms of, um, if we think we're, we're in a post-pandemic uh, um, arena now, and so um, the um, demand on the services, the capacity that we have to manage those, we now have uh, more economic issues for children and young people and their families, and so we will end up with more children in poverty, which quite often leads to more family issues, which means that we may end up with more children and young people in our, our system. Uh, so all of those challenges are, are coming towards us. We've got unaccompanied asylum seeker children. We're about to have another hotel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so all of those things are outside uh, of children's services that we need to have our eye on in terms of horizon gazing whilst we're managing what's, what's going on in the service. Okay, th thank you for that answer. I mean, I, I would say, I think I'll probably speak for all of us, if you do need any help with the external factors, do please let us know you know, anything that we can do. Um, thank the, you. That's very well. The, 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 the other bit is, is uh, 
the, the finance, the money bit. Uh, Satsandra did uh, talk talk about this. Uh, uh, it mentioned it on page 88. Um, the LGA carrying some significant wider financial challenges, um, including the potential of a 114 notice. Um, and um, down page 93, I think. Oh, no, sorry, that's past page, page 93, sorry. Um, so um, several mentions of the implications of the budget situation. Um, so um, he also said, said that, that the um, developing constructive relationship between the 151 officer and the DCS, which I'm, I'm really pleased to see, uh, that, that's very encouraging. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to ask lots of questions on finance, but I don't think really tonight that we might do that. And we've got a, a budget cafe coming up soon, which I think we will uh, hear a lot of information on, on that. Um, but what I'm interested in is, is how can we as a committee keep an eye on this? I'm thinking post-budget cafe, um, walking up to the, 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 the um, setting the budget next year. Um, I would like us to, to have a, a handle on this. Um, yeah, that, that, that would be most welcome. And I think I think the budget cafe would give us an opportunity to really look at some of those those issues. Um, children's need to be accountable for how we manage and manage our, our budgets. Uh, we also need to be funded uh, appropriately, but we also need to give evidence of what funding is that we we need. Uh, and we also need to participate in the in the savings agenda. Um, and, uh, you know, support the council to support children's appropriately financially, but also children's to be financially accountable for how we spend our, our money. And so some of those structures and processes need to be in place. Um, but it would be good to have that conversation at the budget cafe. I think it would take us into different areas. Yeah, I mean, my, my particular interest is, is, is risk, um, the, the, the risk of the violence of, 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 on, on children. So, so my session is we, we, we do the budget cafe and, and maybe we talk about what work uh, as a committee we, we might want to do uh, following that. Um, is is there um, any, any, anybody else got any questions? Um, yeah, I can check. check yes, yeah, of course, sure. Okay, okay happy. Just say thanks to you and all the team for all the, all the work you're doing. You know, it's the most important thing the council does is keeping children safe and it's just so reassuring to see improvements that you're all making as a team and anything we can do to support that is yeah but just please let us know but thanks again if you can pass that on to myself and the whole committee for the, the work that you're doing i think just look at just referring to page 82 it, it makes a comment about the delays and, and some children experiencing getting the um the social services they need could you talk us through exactly what those delays are and what we're doing to rectify those thank you yeah so that 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 is about um uh robust decision making in a timely way so i think officer was saying you're making the right decisions but you're not always doing it in a timely way and so children might be left in delay, in delay. so um I, if i give an example so if a child is living in domestic violent uh, situation and the father has moved out uh, it, have we made the right decision in that case? Are we seeing mum as the um, safeguard in that scenario? Because what happens as soon as dad comes back? Should we have made different decisions? So it's just around, uh, we might make temporary decisions, but really at the end of the day, dad comes back, we might then have to rethink what our decision making is around for that child. And are we doing that in the most timely way? So they didn't find anybody at risk. I just want I want to say that, but it was more about um, that more um, exploratory um, and uh, what did they use the word? They used the word um, um, about it's more exploratory uh, social work, and curiosity, professional curiosity, curiosity, professional curiosity. That 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 was it. Rather than just dealing with what you see. It's actually make, having some more curiosity about mum in that scenario, being the safe person, and is she actually safe, and what's she going to do? Yeah, it's that that kind of thing, really. I suppose the definition of sorry, Chair, really, but the definition of time is very difficult in the work. Yes. You folks do. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It changes completely on the situation. Yeah, so. yeah. And 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 you know, the the bottom line is is that you you know you have to think family first because that's that's where children you know that where they should be but be safe within that, isn't it? Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. And thank, thank you me. very much for your uh, comments earlier. And I will say I work with an absolutely amazing team who are working very, very hard 
to manage all the components that, that have been talked about today to get it over the line and so they're doing an absolutely brilliant job so thank That's you very much for that yeah okay i think um andy's got one more question Yes, yeah, so apologies for, for uh, asking so many questions. Obviously, I'm trying to play catch up. Um, so just quickly on page 88, um, I, I, I like the phrase various corporate insecurities, which obviously, uh, which refers to a lot of things that, that are clearly outside of your control, and you hinted at that earlier on. Um, could you just explain to me very briefly what, um, what the, establishing a trust would mean? Yeah, so... Um... I'll try and do it quickly. Uh, to establish a trust, we would be moving children's social care outside of the council control. And so that would take a, a period of time um, to develop the trust into a legal entity. Uh, and so that would also be how you then divide all the services up and how you, uh, you will contractually, uh, you will contractually uh, manage children's services and so how would that look and how would you put that in place? Who would manage that contract? How much money would you give the children's services? So you would end up with two legal teams who would actually take you through all of that, plus also a um, transformation team who would help and assist you doing that. I did that in Northamptonshire and it took us uh, probably about a year to 18 months to actually from start to finish. Thank you. Uh, obviously, the report says that given these corporate insecurities that the, tr the establishment of the trust cannot be discounted yet so hopefully not uh, i would say that we're working very hard with corporate colleagues and corporate colleagues are working very hard with us to to not uh, have that as an option um, thank you very much okay thank you i think enough i, I think a bit of something about uh, first of all i would like to echo uh, what, what sean said it, it's um Obviously, a huge amount of hard work is going on here. It's the, the, this report well, was a very interesting one to read because you, you could you could see the things that we've been discussing previously. That they, they weren't surprises here. That it was you, you could see things that you've already highlighted to us were being picked up, and, and those seeds that you've been championing are also being noted here. But with, which is a, it's nice when you see the same things from different perspectives, which which sort of overlap quite a lot. Um, so just to um, sum up, because we have gone, I've talked about all sorts of things here. Um, so we, we've talked uh, about LGR um, uh, for, for, on a number of occasions mm -hmm. and, and the complexities of that um, and relates it to Mosaic and, and other systems. Um, the Children's Trust has been the theme that we've talked about quite often uh, in this discussion. Um, starts sort of almost the second thing we talked about uh, and, and the final thing. Um, so uh, yes, uh, LGR recurring issues, um, ongoing human resources um, and financial uh, resources, um, staff turnover and agency staff. Um, uh, again, it's one of the issues which we have talked about quite a lot, but, but again here. Um, uh, consistency, consistency, sorry, um, striving uh, for stab stabilization of the team, um, external uh, factors, um, budget again, um, the delays um, uh, and what causes them um, and, and as part of the decision making process um, and, and this lovely term co corporate insecurities which, uh, which I thank you for, for bringing out of, of the, um, that report. I don't think I've missed um, anything there. Okay so um, we'll move on to item nine, the written statement of action um, progress. Uh, another one of our standing items looking to outcomes of the post offset. Um, welcome, Sarah Rampour, I believe, is going to um, um, present this report. Welcome, Thank Sarah. you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, and tonight we've got is our uh, head of SEND as well. So, and uh, I'm, I'm aware that you haven't met her before. Okay, in that um, case, welcome, Helen, and, and, and thank you for attending. I, I, I would have welcomed you right at the beginning if I'd known you were here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.
uh, and I will hand over to Helen um, in a minute. Um, so you can see in your pack um, from pages 121 um, that we've submitted a PowerPoint presentation. So this was what we presented to um, the Department for Education when we met with them in our third monitoring meeting um, recently. Um, so as you're aware, the um, local area inspection in um, June 2021 found eight areas of significant weakness. Um, so we were presenting on our progress um, to, uh, of those work streams, of those eight areas of significant weakness, our next steps, but most importantly, the impact um, that our um, activity has made. Um, so the uh, I won't take you through the PowerPoint because I'll assume you've read it, but the um, PowerPoint went through the eight areas of significant weakness that were then condensed into four and later on five work streams. Um, so we have a work stream around culture, around co-production, where we're working with families and children and young people, around um, joint commissioning, and then um, quite a large work stream, which we've subsequently separated into two work streams, around identifying, assessing and meeting need. Um, so um, the what this meeting was about, because this is our third, we're due for a fourth and possibly final one in February, um, before we're then re-inspected, possibly around the summer time. Um, this was to check that um, we, we know what impact we uh, want to make. We know how we're measuring that impact. So this was very much the, the so what meeting. Um, before I move on to Helen, who's going to talk about some of the positives, um, the uh, slides 120, no, sorry, 100 and page 139, I think it is, in your pack. Um, we... Uh, we were very transparent with the DfE and we talked about um, a number of uh, programme level issues um, that we have in delivering the written statements of action. We have got some um, draft feedback from them where they say that actually they can see, although progress is slow, they can see that progress is being made towards the, the delivery of the written statement. And as you're aware, because you've seen the written statement, it is a huge action plan. But we do have a number of um, uh, sort of risks involved in the programme um, in terms of delivering just that, that the, the, the huge amount of, of change that's needed. Um, but before I look at those risks, um, Helen, I wonder if I can hand over to you and you can talk through some of the positive steps that we've made um, over the last uh, year or so since um, the written statement. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for welcoming me along this evening and giving me the opportunity to share positive feedback from the special educational needs and disabilities team whom I manage. I think the first thing I want to highlight to you is that I have been a, a very visible presence in the community. Um, today I was in Summerford Primary School, which was wonderful. I like to lead from the front, so um, I've advised my team to work in the BCP Civic Centre um, and also to get themselves out into schools more often. That's happening. Um, we're having an increasing presence in both the office and at community hubs and also in our schools, particularly around phase transfers for those young people who are currently in year six, moving on to secondary provision, or for our young people in year 11 who will be making their preparation for adulthood journey. I also attended um, Winchelsea Special School for a joint meeting um, with our Parents and Carers Trust, attended by Sam Best from Health, very well attended and gave the opportunity for a question and answer session for parents, um, but there were also some young people in attendance too. Cathy mentioned at the beginning that our SEND Lead Improvement Partner, or SLIP, um, is a gentleman called Chris Morris from Bedford. He provides Sarah and I with a great deal of support, but that comes alongside some challenge too. Last week, um, he was working with our principal educational psychologist to support her in documenting a recovery plan because we currently aren't meeting our statutory um, guidelines in terms of making the process happen as quickly as it should. And one of the barriers to that 
there's a challenge of not having enough educational psychologists and they come up with some very creative solutions that are working in Bedford and we hope to embed those in BCP as soon as possible. Um, also working very, very closely now with our colleagues in health because the statutory process is for an education healthcare plan. And when we have the monitoring visits, it's imperative that the focus is not solely on BCP, but our colleagues in health are given as robust a challenge as we are. Um, from their point of view, we are introducing a new speech and language programme, um, which is called, oh, let me remember, I want to say balance. Yes, it is the balance the system, balance. which will replace what was called ECCPs, for those of you who, who want to know what it's replacing. And at the heart of that will be training up um, assistant speech and language therapists to work in conjunction with fully qualified speech and language therapists, as we acknowledge that there's a national sort shortage of fully qualified speech and language therapists to be able to deliver the programmes that we need. Um, part of that is historic, but part of it is a direct result of COVID and the impact of lack of socialisation for some of our younger students who would have ordinarily accessed nursery provision or pre-5 and haven't. So we've acknowledged that and we're working very, very closely with our partners in health. And also, um, this isn't just BCP, this is Dorset wide um, too, that we're tapping into that expertise. As Sarah mentioned, one of the work streams is around um, assessing and identifying needs and as part of that, working with our health colleagues, we have identified a neurodevelopmental pathway where we will hopefully improve the diagnostic journey for those young people who currently don't have a diagnosis of autism. The local NHS have been challenged to improve the current wait time to see a paediatrician, which sits at one year. So whilst the youngsters are waiting for that paediatrics, um, appointment, myself and my team are using what we call the graduated response. So getting into schools and saying, don't wait for the diagnosis. These are things that you can do to support these young people to ensure that we're making their needs as best met as we possibly can. And the last thing I want to just highlight is um, Cathy and I lead on the culture work stream and the parents um, who sit on that board alongside us have co-produced a culture values pack that has now been finalised and will be circulated amongst partners, stakeholders, and will hopefully be embedded sooner rather than later within our practice. So there's a lot going on within the SEND team, a lot of activity, a lot of action in the Civic Centre, and a lot going on in the, the community. So I'll um, verify that special educational needs and disabilities is my passion. Um, I started off as a teacher, believe it or not, 30 odd years ago, um, and I'm still going strong and bring some vigor, enthusiasm, and motivation to what is essentially a very, very hard working team. So thank you for inviting me along this evening to, to share some of those positives. Thank you, Helen. Um, so the, the the sort of activity that Helen's described there has been noted by the DfE and in their draft report, they have recognised um, the progress that has been made um, and that we now have our, an approach to capturing that evidence. So looking at the impact, you know, the so what of all that activity. Um, however, there are a number of um, uh, risks that come with the, the, the program and some issues. Um, so one of those is a significant increase in the application for education, health and care and needs assessments. And um, we've seen a huge increase from um, both schools and from parents as well, because schools don't have to be the one to make those applications. It can be parents as well. Um, so our, the service has seen a, a huge increase in that. And um, 
recruitment and retention has been quite difficult. Helen's talked about the um, national issues around recruiting educational psychologists. Um, budget pressures, um, which of course you all are uh, aware of. Um, and we do have some of the some of our milestones that are running behind due to uh, lack of capacity. There is an awful lot of action and activity going on, um, but uh, you know capacity is is quite uh, limited across across the service. Um, so those are really the key points. Um, on slide uh, 141, you can see our next step. So we're very much focusing on the impact of this activity and being able to show that. So we are we, we've got some draft KPIs that um, we are um, sort of tentatively looking at, but really we, we're going to be co-producing those with our parents and carers um, um, to make sure that they, uh, you know, we're all in agreement of what the impact should be. You know, starting with with um, the, the so what of, you know, uh, uh, what do we want for our children and young people in terms of um, uh, in terms of a, a sort of local area response for them? You know, how do we want to impact on their outcomes? Um, we are going to be uh, uh, signing off that values pack at the Next End Improvement Board, and that is going to be shared widely across children's services and uh, and hopefully beyond as well to make sure that that begins to be embedded in terms of this is how we work in children's when we're working with families and children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities. Um, we've got some work on digital developments um, coming on, um, some apps that we're working on, one to capture um, some feedback, uh, a really quick way of capturing feedback from our parents, carers and our, our children and young people, um, and then some further work on our quality assurance development. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you both of you for that uh, extensive report. It's uh, very interesting. I mean, if, if I can uh, start, if I had to start with a couple of questions or one particular, um, we've talked about, um, I'm just taking a quote here, area for improvement, the deep cultural issues leading to weak partnership working between services across education, health uh, and care, and between these services of children and young people with SEND. Uh, and then somewhere else in the report, it says um, uh, weakness in joint working. Um, and you did mention that, uh, did, did allude to that anyway, in what you were saying. Um, so, um, this, the, two parts of the question, what is being done to, to address this? And, and working between agencies is always complex, especially when they're large agencies that, that, that you, you are dealing with. Um, and um, what, what's the balance of responsibility and accountability for, for, for these weaknesses? Thank you, Chair. Um, and Helen and Kathy may want to sort of chip the. Uh, and what I think the thing to note about that culture is it takes time to embed because we are, like you say, not just working in, in BCP Council, we are working across the local area. The um, inspection in June last year was a local area inspection. So in, inspectors spoke with health colleagues, um, they spoke with um, school colleagues, they spoke with parent carers and, and young people. So um, it's, it's a, it's a, long old journey to change the culture of uh, a, you know that system-wide approach um so there are lots of activities in that culture work stream the one that helen um uh, talked about was this uh, you know the values this is the way that we work so we have co-produced seven values that will be at the heart of this this transformation um things like honesty and transparency and um that empathy now you, you you might think that they are um um not necessarily easy to but but sort of quite um uh simple um values but to make sure those are embedded in every aspect of work across the the area is really quite a feat um so many streams in, in that work stream but it's it's very much then working as a whole system approach so what we're doing in the local authority we need to make sure that our health colleagues are doing as well and then we need to make sure that we're working alongside our um our schools because they are the key to that that graduated response um and of course making sure that um you know for example our, our parents and carers have been involved in developing these these values but actually for our parents and carers what they want to see is the well when is it you know when will we see the impact of, of when you're communicating honestly and openly with us you know what will we see what will what will things change um but you're right it's a it's it's a huge task 
Um, I don't know if, uh, because Kathy and Helen lead on the culture work stream, I don't know if uh, either of them want to chip in. That'll be a no. <laughs> <laughs> I was just I waiting know. politely. I was waiting for Helen. <laughs> okay, Helen, would you go, Helen? Yeah, in terms of um, joint working within that, we are we're all equal partners in it. There's no hierarchy. The the parents who co-produce and work with us on that have an equal stake alongside the colleagues in health and social care who are represented in the culture work stream as well. In terms of building up partnership working, I think I can say with confidence that we are far more aligned with our colleagues in social care as one children's service, but also with our colleagues um, across health. Um, we work very closely with the designated clinical officer, Chloe Morley, and with Sam Best, Sarah and I are in multiple meetings at a strategic level, but um, I also meet at an operational level on things like the diagnostic pathway for autism or neurodevelopmental um, conditions. We also work, as Sarah has said, with our schools who are very involved in making sure that we align our services, especially now that um, Dorset University Trust has changed and we're now going to be having the integrated care boards, which have a very neighbourhood focus on health, and that will be very much aligned to what we hope to deliver from uh, special educational needs and disabilities um, to you. Thank you. Kathy, do you want to add anything or, or are you... Um... No, 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 that's fine. Right. Yeah, um, I mean, just, just, just following up with that, because um, you're talking about the, the working with larger organisations, you mentioned the one-year waiting list for um, uh, Pediatrics. Yeah, that's pedi right. I mean, one year for an adult is a long time. Um, what one year for a child is, is, is an eternity, isn't it? I mean, we, we all know with the young children. Yeah, this, I always remember the summer holidays. They used to go away at one. You know, six weeks later, there were different people when they came back. Um, so, so yeah, that that, that does concern. And that's not a, 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 a. It's not that's a health issue, isn't it? But it's interesting here. You're saying the. Uh, now, you mentioned somewhere um, a list of co-production, uh, co-produced work to date. Um, now, um, it, that's quite an interesting list to see. Is, is that shareable at some point? Uh, so we're collating that because um, that, that's part of my work stream on, on co-production because that was something that we were challenged on, that we didn't know the difference between co-production and consultation uh, and we were doing neither very well. So um, the, we, we started as we, we were meant to go on, which was actually co-producing um, for each of those 70 days that we had to, to, to develop the written statement of action. Um, and we've taken it on from there. You know, we have a number of parents and carers who have been with us all the way along this journey since um, since we got the letter from the, you know, the report from Ofsted. Um, so we, we are still collating that list, but absolutely I can share that um, possibly at the next um, ONS meeting because we're still collating it because it requires people. So every piece of work that we're doing, it means submitting it on the survey. So um, I can share that with you at a later date. Yeah, I mean, I quite understand that, that I imagine that list is going to be updated and, and added to um, mm. yeah, all the time, really. So, so it's never going to be a... A static in this visit. Well, we're constantly right? nagging people to fill that form in. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I love it. It's a, it's a really good language. way of. It's a really good way of showing um, that that the impact of that uh, you know that co-production of showing just how wide we are co-producing. And also to mention that we also circulate an annual um, send survey um, that was started being circulated the second week in November. Um, and that's circulated as well from colleagues in health as well as um, education. We try to get it out in as many platforms as we possibly can. Um, and from that feedback, we use that to improve and build upon our services based on the feedback that we're given. You see, see Helen, I'm slightly worried now. I, I've, are you reading my notes? Have, have you got to? Because my next, because my next question, what was about the sensor they uh, launched in, in November? Um, 
and I've seen it. I've seen it advertised um, and, 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 and oh, you know, locally. So, so, so that uh, I don't know if other people have seen it, but I know I definitely have. Um, has, has it been much response to that now, or, or, or are you getting some some input into that? I had a meeting last Thursday um, with the, the people whom I charged with getting it out to as many places as they possibly could. And the feedback I had was at the moment we have, I think, roughly 3,200 education healthcare plans. And the figure as of last week was in the region of, I think it was 170 responses from parents and carers, but the challenge for me was to get the feedback from the young people whom we are supporting. Um, as of last week, the figures from young people were not particularly high. However, I was told that they're on a part, if not slightly higher than we had um, this time last year. So there is a push to um, try and get the, is it called the Children's Parliament, Sarah? We have representatives here, um, the Youth Parliament, yes. Youth Parliament, please, okay, please, please um, circulate, share far and wide. Um, and again, we are urging our school colleagues to participate and involve the young people because they're at the heart of everything that, that we do. So it's imperative we have their feedback. Well, it so happens we do have two members of the Youth Parliament here. Um, and, and so um, if I get them to press their button and say something, yeah. you'll see them. Um, and Dylan, I think, wants to, to say something. Yeah, and no, I was just wondering about um, the schools. Um, so uh, we, because obviously we both attend school. Um, so I was, um, do, do you want us to go about that by contacting head teachers or, or middle leaders about, about, the, um, about that survey? My team have already, um, so the two people in my team whom I, I asked to do this have, have already um, contacted schools and I believe there's a QR code that can be scanned as well because we tried to make it as hip as we possibly could. <laughs> I'm afraid scanning QR codes is beyond me. Um, but it would be helpful if you could revisit that and ask if it has actually reached your your head teachers to to get it out there it might even be easier to ask the same at school because i believe that that that's whom the information would have gone to and we had the senko forum last week um where those senkos from bcp had the the qr code they had all the information and we urged them um to get the information out to parents families and most importantly to the young people whom we're here to, to support. Um, so if you could put an impassioned plea into your Senko, that would be very helpful, just so that we can reach as wide an audience as we possibly can. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll send Sorry. it to you as well, Dylan. Yeah, no, I was, I was literally about to ask you to the words out of my mouth, Sarah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I have this image now of you wandering around the, 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 the playground, uh, the, back at the bike sheds. There's a QR code. Uh, yeah, um, which, yeah, um, yeah, uh, we, we have the sport worker for the youth parliament here. So, so um, I think you want that for the name, but Yeah, it's just a comment really that the members of youth parliament can certainly do something to, to reinforce what you're asking. But what we found in um, other work, especially when we're trying to get this sort of information, it can be really useful to run targeted groups with young people. So I was just, I know you've got a new worker and I don't know whether there's something there that might work, but um, <clears throat> previous, for instance, we've done things with Victoria School, for instance, when you can put a group together and that might help you to generate a bit more. It works in terms of helping the young people to understand, but it also then often the schools get more engaged because they see it in action. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, thank Jo. You. Um, we, we do have a... Um, send participation worker who's been with us for about three months so she's still learning the ropes and it's a it's a new role in send um but joe i i think um with a potentially a bit of support from you i think she we will get better at that you know that's her job is to reach out to children and young people yeah um, so thank you that's, that ended up being a, a lot longer and more complex answer than that then than, than it, i expected um, are there any other members of May? Um, th thank you, Chair. 
Um, and thank you to um, Sarah for, for the report. So I've got two questions which are slightly different. Um, the first one is just a little bit of a concern in the rise in the number of EHCPs in the area and how do we compare with a comparable local authority or a neighbouring authority. And then I think Sari mentioned uh, slide 141, the first bullet point, which is uh, that there were, get, there were KPIs being worked on. And so whether when they're ready, we could actually have, have sight of those. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Haynes. Yes, I'll, I'll hand over to Helen to talk about EHC. Those KPIs, um, so we've got some draft KPIs that we've developed, but absolutely, um, it will probably tie in actually, because our next monitoring visit is February. Um, so I think that will tie in with our next um, children's ONS. So we can certainly bring those um, for your scrutiny, yes. Um, Helen, so the other question was about EHCP. So National trends. Yes, thank you. Helen, did you want to answer that one? Just to say that based on the, the information we have from statistical neighbours and geographical neighbours like Dorset, is that there continues to be an increase in the request for education healthcare needs assessment. Um, and one of the contributory factors to that is we had a dip um, during the pandemic. Um, so now we're seeing the, the kind of backlash of that in terms of a swell from some schools, but also um, an increase in parental requests as well for assessment. Mm, interesting. <laughs> the answer, Helen, about increase in requests from, from, from parents, um, I probably shouldn't say any more on that matter, but but obviously because I sit on another panel where EHCPs are actually talked about quite a bit and it just struck me that again I come back to the word consistency uh, hearing things such as one school has a different criteria to a different school and that in itself is a bit of a concern when I hear something like that to say well if the child is being assessed as to whether they will actually need an EHCP I think there has to be consistency between schools as to how that's being done um but that's really a comment chair so thank you yeah i, I suppose it is a comment but, but it, it is sort of a question this right. is, is is the in, inconsistencies uh, um I, i'm not sure whether that is an easy question to answer right now but uh, uh would you like you, me to answer it well is it is it answerable at, at the, the moment? answerable is it's statutory guidance um so if there in, if there are inconsistencies within school which Sarah and I are working very hard to address because this is something that was also highlighted um in one of the 180 points from the appreciative inquiry that we do need to improve inclusivity um, across BCP but the guidance is statutory guidance applied nationally um, so there, there shouldn't be any inconsistencies in how it's applied um, within our schools. So, so summing that up, if there are inconsistencies, somebody's wrong, basically. Well, it's up to the, the school yes, to, to make sure yeah. that they're following the statutory guidance. Yeah. Um, just, just, just a slight input, because I did praise uh, an earlier um, um, report for, for um, this, the, not using acronyms, and uh, we are now in acronym territory only do this just to make sure AHCPs are educational health and care plans um, and KPIs are key performance indicators and uh, just just in case um, anybody's listening who wasn't picking that up. Uh, Sandra you've got your hand you've been waiting patiently there. Yeah thank you chair um, yeah thank you for the report um, that was really good um, I'm quite impressed about the uh, huge amount of work that's uh, clearly taking place uh, to drive improvement. And I just wondered how well you're managing to keep track of all the work that you are doing and the progress you're being made and, and the progress that you need to make. Because um, the more you do, the more difficult it is to keep track of where you are. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Um, it's very difficult. We have an amazing programme manager, Joe Hooper, 
um, who keeps us on track and we have project managers who uh, so for each of the work streams we have project managers who we, we couldn't do it without them because they really do keep us in check and make sure um, that we are doing our next steps because we have to then report with our um, to, to highlight reports so like Helen was saying there are lots of meetings where you know um, every every week there are several meetings and in fact I think one day there were five meetings where just one after the other and parents and carers as well and and we do have to acknowledge the time um, that our parents and carers are giving up out of their their own time to support us with that journey so um, it's very much appreciated um, you know to the point of five meetings in one day and we'll all get sick of each other um, but yeah there is a, an awful lot of, of activity going on so um, in terms of the, the governance, so we have um, uh, certain boards that we report into and then we have uh, different timescales of when those reports need to be. And it just seems like as soon as you've done one, then you're doing another one. Um, but yeah, we have um, a really um, good team of programme manager and project managers. And, and I think something that we need to get better at is celebrating some of the positives because uh, because we are so sort of focused on wanting to make those improvements and we are all, always kind of looking at, at the things that need to be improved, we, we don't spend a lot of time celebrating um, the, you know, the, 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 the positives that we have got. And I think working with our parent carers is, is a huge positive that needs to be celebrated, um, that, you know, our, our relationships with them are, are much stronger. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I totally agree. You do need to celebrate that because that is one heck of an achievement compared yeah. to as it yeah. was. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I was looking around to any, any other questions. I know I've got one more, but uh, just, just in case, John. Oh, oh, sorry, Eddie first. That must be me. Just, I'm sorry if I've, if I've missed this. Could you just summarise what the deep cultural issues are? I'm not sure. But, you know, who to address that to, but we could have a brief summary, that'd be helpful. Thank you. So, yes, so um, they, they're referenced in our, um, the initial inspection letter, but it's it's things like, um, uh, you know, the, the lack of communication, the lack of um, sort of oversight across, um, you know, how SEND fits into all those different areas. Um, the, the, the fact that it's it's because it's a, an area inspection, it's not just a local authority issue, it's schools issue and it's a health issue um, as well. Um, and it might be easier, actually, Councillor Gabriel, if I send you the inspection letter um, because it sets it out really well, much better than I could in that. Oh, thanks. Sir. That's very kind. I, I'll you. ping it across to you. Great. Thank you. Um, Eddie, did you have a... No, no. No, you didn't. OK. So um, I know I've got. Uh, let me just find my my uh, my, my last one. Um, oh yes, the, the first pre-exclusion case conference um, we, we we had about six October. So, so so we've had that now. Yes, um, I'm, I'm just wondering basically how did it go? Um, what what's the learning points? Um, and yes. and have, have have we had any more since? Oh, yes. So they're held every fortnight. Um, I'll probably hand over to Helen, actually, because Helen's um, on the panel. Um, they're proving very popular for schools to refer into. Um, so, yes, every fortnight. And um, it's it's sometimes it's a case of trying to sort of trim down the agenda. Helen, did you want to just give an overview? Yeah. So rather than call it pre-exclusion um, conferences, we call it an education entitlement meeting. Um, because we want to make sure that the young people whom are discussed, we're discussing their entitlement to education at those meetings. They are chaired by um, Kelly Twitchin, the head of the virtual school. Um, and we have one, two, three, four head teachers um, who sit on it. Um, they've been there the times that I've been. So one representative from special, one from secondary, one from primary. And the schools are invited in to discuss the young person at risk of exclusion. We also have Dr Claire Young from CAMS. When she's unable to attend, she makes sure that there's another representative from CAMS there. And as of last week, I directed educational psychology to ensure that we have a representative from our educational psychology team sitting on the education entitlement 
um, meeting. So schools will come and raise young people who are at very high risk of exclusion. We listen to the, the rationale for this. We unpick and collectively we come up with um, some solutions which we ask the school to trial. When the school come, it's very clear that there's not going to be any additional funding attached to the solutions that we offer. We also make it clear that there's no magic wand. Um, however, thus far, fingers crossed, touch wood and everything else that we want to do, none of the young people who have been brought to this Educational Entitlement Board um, thus far have had um, a permanent exclusion or suspension. Quite often, um, schools are coming saying that they are at their wits end, they can't try anything else. The only option they have is to um, impose a fixed term suspension or in some cases go straight to a fixed term exclusion if there have been um, previous instances of suspension. However, working collectively, um, we, we've managed to to improve the, the education outcome for these young people presently. Okay, thank you, um, that, sir. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to add to that that sometimes it involves referral on to external agencies, and that's why it's also good to have this um, joint working with our partners and colleagues from health, in particular CAMS, because sometimes the diagnostic pathway or route to referral can be quite confusing. Sometimes things have, have changed, the parameters are different, and it's a, a learning curve for the schools who raise these young people at these meetings. Yeah, thank you very much for that answer. And I, I sympathise with trying to trim down agendas. I, I, I would add that straight away. Um, in that case, um, I, I think it's time to, to, to sum up on this one. Um, we, we've, we've covered quite a few things. Um, the increase in EHCPs has been talked about, um, the reasons for them, uh, and the fact it's happening on a, a couple of times and different points here. Um, partnership working problems and um, and, and how, how they're being uh, resolved. Um, the um, STEM survey, uh, 170, I think that's a good number at, at this stage. Yeah, I'll, I'm pleased to see you, that we're getting that. And how to increase the number of young people taking part of the survey. Um, the, um, the KPIs and uh, what they're being worked on. Um, keeping the tack, uh, a track of the progress and how um, that is being done and, and um, we've talked about. Um, deep cultural issues um, was one thing that um, we've been enlightened on. Um, and the pre-exclusion conference, uh, which has now been called Education Entitlement Meetings, um, which is, I think, is probably a good yeah, positive, a nice change, actually. Um, so it's just, um, as a committee, we need to... Um, um, decide the, the current progress against the eight areas of significant weakness as detailed in the attached monitoring report to be approved. Uh, let's have a look. Are we, are we all happy with approving that as a committee? Yeah. Um, and, and basically note uh, the report, um, um, which I think we have done. Um, now, looking at it, it's, it's, we've, we've nearly been at this for two hours, three minutes off two hours. So I'm suggesting now we, we take a a quick 10 minute break just to give us a chance to uh, stretch our legs and, and refill our glasses or, or, or whatever. Um, so, so that house today, if, if we get back here for just gone 10 past. Um,
Okay, I'd just like to welcome everybody back. Um, we are now on to agenda item 10, which is the school attainment and progress for 2022. So this was, uh, this report was added to our forward plan by Sarah in March of this year. Um, it's here to allow us to maintain oversight and target future scrutiny if required. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Sarah Rempel, our Director of Education, to present the report. I think it will also Georgie Pinter may be uh, joining as well. So welcome, Georgie. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'll uh, uh, to Georgie. Uh, so the report um, starting on page 145 in your pack. Um, so this is uh, an overview of the um, attainment so far. Um, so you'll see early years results, year one and year two phonics results. Um, key stage one and key stage two SATs results, um, and then our key stage four and key stage five results. Um, so I'll take you through the uh, early years and primary. Um, so things to note, so this is the uh, appendix um, in, in the report. Um, so uh, the, the, the positives are that we are above national for our early years, our good level of development. Um, areas that we'll be working on this year will be um, boys. They achieve significantly less well than girls in their in their early reading and, and writing and maths, and disadvantaged pupils. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, in terms of our year one, uh, our phonics results. Um, so nationally. Um, we were uh, national results were down this year and we were in line with national, which is is great. Um, slightly disappointed. Last year we were in line with national um, as well, um, but um, possibly COVID. I think lots of schools are reporting that there was that impact um, on our youngest, um, our, our youngest members. This would have been um, sort of of some of our nursery and reception years um, so quite likely that has impacted on their on their early phonics um, in terms of key stage one um, again we are um, above national um, and our areas for further development at key stage one is our greater depth um, greater depth writing because although it's above national it is the the weakest of, of those uh, three subjects in terms of key stage two, again, above national, slightly above national, um, but in key stage two, it's those disadvantaged pupil groups which remain um, behind um, the other pupils, although it is it is closing a little bit. And in terms of our disadvantaged pupils across the board, um, it is very much a focus because we are um, inconsistent um, in our um, results this year um, in terms of our dis disadvantaged pupils. Georgie, did you want to take us just quickly over our Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5 results? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as Sarah was saying, it's a, it's a mixed picture. There's actually lots of positives to report with regard to um, Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5. Um, a bit of context. Um, and I'm sure we've all remembered, um, but these were the first public exams students sat since 2019. So although students have sat a range of um, internal examinations, um, they haven't sat any public exams. Um, and so given what this cohort of students have been through in the last few years, they, they really deserve a huge amount of congratulations um, because our results um, locally um, are very strong at Key Stage 4. Um, so this data, as Sarah's said this already, um, some of this data is quite provisional. Um, so if you'd like us to, we can come back again um, in February. I know we've mentioned that um, a number of times uh, through the evening um, to just update this report a little bit with a, just a little bit more detail, especially around how certain groups of young people performed. Um, we've kind of got some of the headline figures at the moment, but we haven't got um, perhaps some of the detail. So um, if you'd like a kind of a, a bit more detailed report, we can do that um, later on um, in the academic year. Um, I think um, some of the things to, to highlight in the report for attainment eight, um, and so that's the kind of one of the performance measures that the government uses. Um, actually, BCP as a local authority um, ranked number 25 out of 156 local authority areas um, for the attainment marks that, that young people were getting. Um, and so that was a strong, um, strong set of results that our young people achieved. 
given the fact that this was their first lot of public examinations. Um, and actually, one of the areas of focus um, we've been looking at with schools in the last few years, or since really we became BCP, was how we start to narrow that disadvantage gap. Um, and actually, for the first time this year, we have seen a narrowing of the gap um, between pupils, so that all of pupils and our disadvantaged pupils. So. Um, at secondary level, we're seeing, um, you know, real progress being made across the school system. Um, so again, something, some positives there. Um, we have seen a bit of a decline in one of the performance measures, which is the EBAC measure. So that's got some of the traditional, more traditional subject curriculum routes. So less students across our secondary system are taking um, the the kind of the traditional um, subject pathways. And that's to say that's the EBAC uh, pathway. Um, I don't necessarily see uh, we don't necessarily see that to be a complete negative because what that actually shows us is that actually we're getting quite a good wide curriculum offer um, across the sort of school system um, and a curriculum offer that um, allows students to follow um, certain kind of applied pathways as well. Um, so although there is a bit of a dip across that EBAC um, area, um, as I say, it does it does also show that we've got kind of real broad curriculum across across the school system. Um, uh, the other thing uh, I've mentioned um, uh, with regard to disadvantaged students, I think when we think back to COVID and we think about um, young people um, sitting these first lot of public exams, um, there was um, the way the grade boundaries were sat, set this year um, was to allow a bit of um, balancing out of the system. So there's been a lot of talk about um, inflated grades um, in in 2020 um, when we had the algorithm um, and 2021 when we had teacher assessed grades. Um, and actually what we've always said um, and, you know, believe quite strongly is actually um, it was less about grade inflation and it was more about taking the double double jeopardy away of kind of sitting exams. Some of the risk was taken away for students um, because um, there was a range of assessments that schools could put in place. Um, but certainly from um, our overview of those assessments, we saw um, assessment processes to be really robust. Um, what the expectation this year was that um, grades might fall quite considerably from uh, 2021 and we didn't see that locally um, and again that kind of really starts to show that we had really good assessment processes across uh, across our school system um, and schools should really be um, kind of congratulated for allowing their students to still make progress even through the disruption um, of the last few years and again we will go into more detail and look at what that looks like for certain groups of students as that data comes through. Um, we've talked a lot this evening as well around kind of um, the system, um, so outside of the council and working with our stakeholders and partners. Um, and I think the other thing um, just to note is that um, some of the collections we do with our data teams across the council like statutory collections um, and so schools need to report into us and report into the DfE etc cetera, etc cetera. and some of the collections are non-statutory collections and so we ask our schools um, to share information with us or they have data sharing agreements with us and all of our schools share that information with us and they did right way through COVID um, even when as I say there, there wasn't kind of uh, national benchmarks so we have three-year data sets and we don't have any gaps in our data so again we can really um, look at what's happened look at the journey that young people have been on um, and see where we need to go and where to improve um, so as I say some of this is unvalidated data and so it's why we wouldn't uh, name school settings um, specifically um, and just really talk about kind of the, the system although we do work obviously with schools on an individual level as well um, so some of the um, uh, positives around um, Key Stage 5. Um, so the, the data pack that you've got in front of you is for A-levels particularly, um, and at the moment we don't have the college information um, included in that. So the college don't teach A-levels, um, they teach vocational courses. Um, and so the um, data pack that you've got just is, a, is from our school six forms. 
um, and again, um, they're um, broadly with a strong set of results um, at A level. Um, one of the things um, we are working really closely with our sixth forms and with the college on is retention rates. So how many children and young people start courses and how many young people finish their courses and don't drop out kind of through, um, through, through their studies. Um, and what we have noticed um, for um, our students taking A-levels is actually there has been a bit of a dip in retention um, this year. Um, and we would potentially put that down, as I say, to these public exams being sat. Um, because if you look at some of the data pack, um, when we talk about the applied subjects, so that's where there's more coursework based subjects um, and opportunity to, for students to sit a range of assessments, actually the retention rates are, are much better. Um, and so there's something there around kind of preparation for exams um, and perhaps kind of feeling um, um, uh unsure because our year 13s last year would not have sat year 11 exams um so that kind of gives you that very kind of high level overview um the the key areas as sarah um mentioned um across the system is um really looking at how we support our disadvantaged young people um, and so continuing to close that gap making sure that um our disadvantaged young people um do transition onto um, uh, pathways that they want to follow, um, regardless of their background. Um, continuing to cha um, champion the breadth of uh, curriculum, um, and particularly around SEND young people. So obviously that links into um, the work we're doing with SEND. Um, and um, we've talked about speaking and listening. Again, that kind of builds back into speech and language and the other work the SEND team. Um, are doing around that um, and um, kind of some of the, the hot off the press um, data and information we're looking at at the moment um, is um, around how many um, female students actually are going on across BCP to study STEM subjects. Um, so we commissioned some data work um, with um, a company called Alps that really allows us to look at subject level data. Um, and what we've noticed is across lots of our STEM subjects, we have about half the amount of female students um, sitting things like maths, physics, chemistry, computer science, um, compared to um, their male peers. Um, and we do a lot of work um, around careers, pathways, next steps. And so it's really looking at what the barriers um, are potentially for, for females going on to study some of these set uh, STEM subjects and how that links into um, our skills agenda. Um, so that's kind of a bit of a whistle stop tour and obviously happy to answer any questions and Sarah might want to come back in there as well. Thank you Georgie. Well, thank you, Georgie. Um, so just to draw your yes yes if that's all right just finally to draw your attention on our emerging priorities which are on page 152 of your pack but like georgie said um we will come back if that's okay um in this in the sort of early spring um with the validated data yeah, thank you for that and, and yes I'll, I'll i'll come on to that offer um to, at the end because i think it's a very good one um i, I I know that uh, Annabelle and, and Dylan have got quite a few bits to ask of this. I wasn't, I was going to let them stop, but I'm, I'm sorry, Julie, you did press all my buttons, um, which I'm just going to have to say something. Um, and it's all right, I'm, I'm not, that's not what you said, it's, it's actually supporting what you said. Um, inflated grades is one of the things that really annoy me that, that um, when grades go out, um, that the press and the, and the public uh, all, all say yes, but, oh, yes, but, yes, but. And of course, we need to celebrate you know, that every grade is, is a grade for uh, some, somebody's worked hard for that. Um, and and the, the whole idea of inflated grades, I, I think it's very damaging um, and, and uh, shouldn't be talked about. Um, but um, I'm, I'm looking over to um, Annabelle and Deering. Um, did you have some questions to start with? Oh, I've got so many questions, Richard. So, uh, OK. <laughs> so many. Well, yeah. well, OK. How long have we got there? Oh, I don't know. Uh, how long have we got? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Get get going, yeah. and, and, and I might interrupt you uh, and to give, give yeah. you a rest, sure. uh, and, and then we'll take you from there. Um, 
so I think my, my first point, um, as, as a member of that GCC cohort, um, I'm just and a um, member of that GCC cohort that got a strong pass in, in maths. I was looking at um, page 149, uh, the English and Mathematics um, statistics. Um, so it's 58.6% it's of, um, of young people achieving that strong pass. And, you know, for someone that got a five, I was so pleased I got that five because it meant I could get into my sick form. Um, but my, my initial worry with this stat is that, um, to me, that shows that only 58.6% are, are looking like they will get into, a, into the top six forms in our area. Um, you all know, I'm assuming lots of people here will know that um, we've got four grammar schools in our area for in BCP. Um, well, that's, that's one of a lot of um, areas in the country. Um, but we've also got um, sick form providers like Twyman School I go to um, and St. Peter's just down the road from there that all ask for strong fives at all like um, uh, for, for strong passes in both English and maths as, a, as base requirements. Um, I just thought um, maybe is that is, is it a problem for the sick forms that they need to um, fix and say, actually, we're willing to take people with um, weaker passes in maths and English? Or is it a matter of BCP and maybe like the statistics? Uh, and, and is there any help that we can do to, to push our um, SCND students and uh, and um, students in uh, at GCSE uh, to get uh, like into those um, strong pass brackets. If uh, someone's some answer. Great question. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, so um, it's a complicated answer, um, but um, there's lots of good news within the answer, um, and. Um, you're right around kind of admissions into sixth form. So we do have um, a lot of sixth forms across BCP and um, that is actually quite unique. Lots of areas have um, uh, schools that finish at the age of 16 um, and then the majority of um, students go on to college or college based sixth forms um, rather than kind of transitioning in their school um, to a sixth form. Um, so it's great because we've got lots of um, offers across the local area um, but it also means it can be quite confusing um, to know you know what what a young person's best next step is going to be um, and so um, the good news is actually lots of our sixth forms do take students um, with um, a good pass um, so uh, a or a standard pass a grade four or above um, it usually comes down to um, subjects so depending on what subject a young person wants to study um, and um, sometimes some subjects will ask for you know a five six or a seven um, to complete a certain subject really because um, our sixth form leaders are very experienced in advising students and what obviously no sixth form leader wants to do is set any young person up to fail um, or, or or find kind of an, an A-level course um, very, very challenging. Um, one of the things um, that's also on the report is around the applied subjects that sit across our sixth form. So again, just remembering that this report is about our sixth forms, it's not about the college. Um, and so over the last few years, we've worked really closely with sixth forms and, and kind of said to them, actually, we've got lots of traditional offers. So that's your uh, A-level offer um, across the school system. And what we've um, explained to them is actually that schools that are also um, delivering applied subjects um, do really, really well. And students that take a combination of A-levels and applied subjects, um, so that might be kind of a Cambridge National um, a technical certificate or a BTEC certificate, um, actually those students do very, very well and their retention rates are good. And often schools will take students on those courses at slightly lesser grades because there's um, there's the continual assessment process that happens. Um, so what we've seen over the last few years is more and more of our sixth forms are offering a really diverse sixth form offer. Um, and we're already talking to sixth forms about having level two provision within their sixth form offer as well. Um, so we've got lots of sixth forms in the area that actually want to offer um, a range of applied courses 
uh, that GCSEs, resets, etc., at sixth form, so that students don't lose out. Um, so um, A levels are still seen as the gold standard, um, but they're not um, they're not necessarily um, you know the the right route or certainly the only route um, onto further education, higher education, or into employment. Um, and we really champion the diverse routes, and we work really closely with colleagues across the career sector to um, really support our sixth forms in being um, a bit less traditional. Um, although we still obviously value um, those kind of A-level subjects as well. Yeah, it's great to hear about the diverse um, options that students have as well. It's so important, especially if, you know, people are achieving uh, less than grade fives in English and maths that they have provisions in place. But yeah, thank you. And just before we move on, because just for those uh, people who don't have an education background, could you just quickly explain what you mean by level two? Yeah, so level two would be your GCSEs. Um, so um, level two qualifications um, are in line with GCSE qualifications um, and um, might be a range of applied subjects. Um, so they tend to be the qualifications that young people take at the end um, of their key stage four, so when they're um, 16. Um, but level two qualifications um, can be taken across the board. So in vocational subjects, um, uh, in apprenticeships, um, et cetera, et cetera, as, as well. So it's just how um, uh, Ofqual, the qualification um, authority, would um, pitch the level of the qualification. Um, and A-levels would be um, seen as level three qualifications. Um, you can also get... Um, qualifications that are vocational um, at level three and that steps up through the system so as you go up to um, degree level etc etc thank you uh, Lisa you've got a, your hand up thanks chair um, just a quick question um, do you find that uh, girls are more inclined to do maths and stem subjects if they're in a single sex school um, you know, is it if they're in a mixed school that they kind of think that the boys are more likely to be doing it and they sort of identify, they don't kind of identify with, with it, with it. Um, whereas if they're in a single sex school, then they, you know, there's nothing sort of to make them think that it's not for them. Um, I don't know. Um, it's something a bit more detailed. So obviously we've got our four um, selective schools, um, but we also have um, what we term um, in the um, education improvement team as a bit of a wonky system um, because we have quite a lot of um, single gender schools in, across the comprehensive system as well. Um, so um, that's kind of been a historic thing um, across um, particularly the Bournemouth area. Um, so we um, we're looking at where there's some lessons that, um, you know, female only sites, male only sites, and we're starting to see those systems merge across our schools now. So the Avonbourne Academies, Winton and Glenmore, where traditionally they've been single sex schools and now actually they're, they're kind of um, co-educational. Um, in, in quite a lot of the areas. Um, but what we would need to do is say we've just started to look at the data with regard to um, pathways at, at Key Stage 5. Um, and in the past, it hasn't been that stark, but this year in particular with maths, um, we've seen um, a real decline in the number of um, females taking maths, for example, as a subject. Um, so yeah, we need to we need to look at that. And it's not it, it it's not necessarily just about um our grammars. It is around the kind of the whole education system. Um again, it's quite unusual to have so many single sex or, um schools a, a, across an area. Um so yeah, it's something that we're definitely looking at. Um and I'm happy to come back and answer that question in a bit more detail when we've kind of fleshed out why that might be. It's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that um, answer. And I, I think actually it's one of the things that we all also, also need to take responsibility for is, is the way that we treat uh, genders and subjects. Um, I, I know I, I heard somebody the other day who said that, that if you meet a girl who's doing uh, um, a degree in maths, the, the thing that she's most likely to hear is, oh, you're a girl doing a degree in maths. And yet if you have a boy doing a degree in maths, the first thing they tend to hear is, oh, you must be clever. 
Um, so, so it, it is it is looking at that, that the way you speak to people. I, I think. Um, do we have any? Um, yes, um, Andy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to pick up on the uh, paragraph thirty-four about um, a few schools' results appear to have declined since twenty nineteen. Um, so, really, just three questions, really. One, um, when you say a few schools, um, how many is a few? Um, in terms of that number, would that be in line with national figures, if, if, if you know that information? And then lastly, um, what could be, it's talking about a potential, well, obviously could indicate a significant decline in performance, doesn't say it definitely is. Um, are there any early indications about what might be the causes of that decline? Um, so um, we've kept a report of quite high level just because I say with some validated data um, and um, uh, as I say kind of some of the data is not a statutory collection um, and so you know really to to ensure our schools do share um, you know information with us and that we report back fairly on that information as well um, so um, that's why um, that we've said a few schools um, Nationally, um, I think there was, um, a, as, well, as I said, BCP have, do, have done well. We're kind of number 25 uh, local authority for, for outcomes. So, um, you know, we are performing well nationally. So um, nationally, more schools would have seen that, that decline. Um, the... Where the... So um, I don't know if you're aware, but exam grades... Um, are not static each year so if you get 50 out of 100 you don't necessarily get um a grade four so one year you might get 50 out of 100 and get a grade four the next year you might need to get 60 out of 100 to get a grade four and each year um Ofqual move the grade boundaries depending on the number of students um so it's the grade distribution depending on the number of students that have met a certain criteria and that's how they allow um to have um year on year comparisons even though the exams and the assessments are different um and so what Ofqual did this year is to make sure there wasn't a, a very steep decline in results is they pulled those results down to the midpoint between 2019 and 2022 levels so you started to see that that result come down um so we expected our schools to dip more this year than they have done. So what we don't, what we're also hearing is that midpoint wasn't as, as low potentially as we thought it might have been. And that's very difficult for us to know. So that's where kind of the um, looking at the grade boundaries and that can be at a subject level as well. So it's it's really complicated because of COVID to look at kind of how that dip is. What we can do at a local level, because we've collected that three year data from 20, from 19, 20, 21 and 22, we can look at trends by our schools. Um, and that's probably um, kind of a more valuable school where, uh, tool to use when we're doing um, our, our um, school improvement and support work kind of across the system and kind of um, leaning in and, and supporting schools um, with some of the challenges they're having. Um, so. Um, probably doesn't quite answer the question um but as i say we can come back um, with more information in february when we have the validated results um so our schools haven't declined as much as most schools nationally um, and a few schools that have dipped down there will be a range of reasons for it okay thank you very much so did, did that answer enough uh, Andy? yeah 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 that's obviously be interesting to see you know the, the fuller detail and the fuller picture in february so Thank you. Did we? Yeah. Possible. Um, as I was just wondering, it's an, another question. I think it's a bit more um, personal, personal relating to like my experience at GCSE. Um, but you, you'll be aware of the advanced information that came out for our for our exams. Um, I, I've had to speak to a member of the youth forum, BCPG forum, but but also a lot of my a lot of my classmates from the cohort. Um, and um, I don't know it's a it's a student thing that will go around maybe, but we reckon that maybe some of the advanced information um, wasn't uh, either wasn't given. And then we had parts of the exam where um, 
where there was no advanced information given or there was parts of the exam where the advanced information um, had said wouldn't come up. Uh, so an example could be my music exam. It's, it's, it's a very random one. Um, but uh, Cuban music was said, but we were told that it wouldn't come up, um, but it did come up in the paper. It was worth about five marks. Um, so I was, my, my uh, question on it was, um, has that had any effect on the data? I know it's slightly linking to uh, previous questions as well. Um, or is that, you know, something that could come out in the later report in February? Or like, you know, what was what their kind of a thoughts on that? So what would have happened? Uh, so, and I think, Dylan, what you're explaining is just how complex, tricky, um, distressing at points the exam system has been for young people over the course of the last few years. Um, and, um, uh, you know, some teachers would report back that actually the advanced information um, was really, really helpful at some in some subject areas and um, some of the crib sheets and some of the science examples that were given with equations, you know, it's really straightforward. Everyone knew where they stood. Other subject areas have reported back that actually the advanced information led to more confusion than less confusion. And that's that's, um, you know, the environment in which you were studying. And it's also the environment in which you received your results. What would have happened through that process is um, Ofqua would have taken all that information and the exam boards would have taken all that information and they would have adjusted their grades accordingly. Um, and so um, uh, you would have ended up with, you know, that that result. So um, I suppose um, it, it comes back to saying congratulations to your cohort for for just how many barriers you overcame um, to, to get to the next step um, and how proud you should be of, of your results and, and, and your cohort of their results. Um, I think probably once it all comes out in the wash and when all those kind of adjustments are made, um, it didn't make a, a huge difference um, to the results that young people got because of that, because of that movement of how um, results were allocated. But what it did do was um, cause a lot of anxiety in the system. And I think um, for young people, you know, that building up of trust in the system as well um, and, you know, longer term um, when when young people are, uh, are putting grades down on a CV, um, I suppose it's also being mindful of um, just how what they mean in that context. And we also work with um, businesses to really kind of try to help them understand um, what um, what grades are and what they mean and what what the profile of a young person is because um you know grades are just one part of the information they're they're you know they're an important hurdle to jump um but they are only one part of a young person's profile um and we know that you know it's much more than just exam results even though i'm talking about data and exam results yeah no, i completely understand that as well um i think it's um really important i think the best bit of advice i've ever been given is that um your grades don't define you um, and I think I think that ring, rings true, especially here in this cohort as well. So thank you for that. Hey, do we have um, anybody else with any questions? No. Um, I, I mean, just, just um, you know, picking up a few of the things that have been said here before I, I sum up. Um, I, I, I think we, we all agree that these are complicated. Um, and yeah, um, and, and what made the difference this year um, is quite difficult to find out. Um, I mean, COVID is, is the, you know, is the elephant in the room as it was, but it's actually more complicated than just COVID, isn't it? It's, um, I mean, it's, if you think about it, that there are quite a few teachers who taught exams this year who've never taught for an external exam before because of the number of years without doing external exams. There, 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 there's no mock exams from last year that are marked and for the people, people to look at. So, so um, plus, plus you know, students haven't had the, the practice of taking external exams. So, so there's quite a lot of information there. So I think we all probably agree that looking at this data, doing a bit of a, a data mine and bringing it back um, in, in the spring would be a helpful thing to do to see whether we can just basically get our heads around it. Um, so um, just to sum um, up, um, so we, we talked um, about uh, the EBAC uh, inflated grades. Um, we talked about the percentage of young people getting uh, a five plus and um, the strong pass and other areas of what uh, students who didn't get such a strong pass could do. Um, 
the, the, the idea of level two um, being taught uh, at sixth form. Um, girls and single sex schools, um, uh, whether the, uh, they have a different result on their STEM subjects um, to uh, in co-ed schools. Um, we looked at indicators of a potential decline um, and whether ours was actually not so noted in some areas and the reasons for that might be. Um, and um, the um, advanced information before exams, which is, which is also a, a fascinating topic. So um, thank you very much for, for that. Um, so I think we, all we have to do for that one is, is note it. So we're now on to agenda item 11, uh, Brighter Future Children's Services uh, Key Performance Indicators Quarter 2. So this was added to our forward plan at the end of June uh, this year after discussion with me. Uh, it's allowed us to monitor issues. Um, just to advise to the committee, which I know you've all seen, um, that there's a supplement to, to this which replaces the, the, the original. Uh, it's an improved um, uh, piece of work um, for us. And uh, so it's an appendix two, which we'll be looking at. So I'd like to uh, welcome Rena Misty, uh, Head of Performance, to present the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this performance update, it provides an overview of the children's services key performance indicators that are covered in the corporate scorecard. Now, the period covered is uh, quarter two, as mentioned by the chair. Um, so it covers the months July through to September. Now, the KPIs detailed in the report and covered in the scorecard cover three areas. They are permanency and corporate parenting front door and early help and education. Now I'm trusting um, that you have read the update and reviewed the scorecard. So um, if it's okay with you, Chair, um, I'd like to go straight to questions. Um, okay, do we uh, have, have any um, questions at the moment? Uh, I, I've got a, as, as normal, I've got a few, but uh, I'll see you. OK, if I kick off then and see if anyone wants to join you in a minute. Um, so we talk about schools where Ofsted ratings, 11.62%. Uh, now, there's lots of, there's several reasons why schools don't have an Ofsted rating. And I, I think what we can probably, I mean, I'm guessing that some of the schools in their Ofsted rating, if you was to you know, have a stab in the dark at it, you'll probably think that those schools will probably come out as it being quite good at an Ofsted. And some of the schools that uh, don't have Ofsted ratings, you might go, mm, I, I might be slightly concerned. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing here. Um, as you, so um, do we have a, a feel for that 11.6% um, of, of where they would be? You know, and are we missing putting some of our children in a school which may be good, might be the best school for them, um, just because they don't have an Ofsted rating? Sarah, are you OK to step in to answer this question? Sorry, I missed that last bit because the sound just went. Sorry, Councillor Burton. Right, yeah, of course, I'll, I'll repeat that. What, what my question yeah. was, is, 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 is there a risk of, of not placing a pupil in a school just because they don't have a current Ofsted rating? Uh, because you know, you're placing them to, to, to be uh, uh, good or better. And um, without a rating, they, they come up as not in that category. Is there a risk of missing opportunity to place a pupil at a school which might be appropriate for them just because they don't have an Ofsted rating? Um, so thank you. Um, so, so most schools who don't have an Ofsted rating are because they have currently um, they have just transferred to um, potentially like a, a multi academy trust. Or, for example, um, so for example, Avonborn Boys, that was previously um, Harewood College. Um, so we, we might say that they don't have an Ofsted rating. Um, and there are a couple of schools who don't have an Ofsted rating, for example, Avonwood, because they're a new school and they haven't been um, they haven't been visited um, by our friends from Ofsted yet. So um, I would say that those schools who do, we could look, we would look at those schools because there would be a reason why they won't have have an Ofsted rating, um, and usually it's because there are there there are very new provision. Yes, so, so would that preclude preclude putting all of our young people there, or, or would would that still? 
So, so it wouldn't. So um, we wouldn't be looking at moving a child if their school, um, if their school didn't have an Ofsted rating, because we would look at, um, you know, the reasons why. So no, it wouldn't. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, look, we've got the neat numbers uh, that they are for pupils are not in educational training. Um, we were talking the yearly cycle is it, it, is quite obvious, and I. And I Shall I, I, I get me closer because I can see you're straining to hear me. I'll, I'll put on my loud voice. No, the sound has just gone a bit clunky. Okay. Um, so it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, so we've talked about the, 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 uh, neat, the neat uh, numbers um, and the yearly cycle, which, 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 which I totally get. Um, and um, I'm just wondering, have the neat numbers gone down in the way you would expect them to have gone down at this point in the cycle, understanding that this report is now, you know, as all reports are, you know, slightly out of date? The neat, am I okay to answer that, Sarah? So, um, yes, Chair, the neat numbers are going down. Um, we do have some provisional data, but in the next day or so, the validated data will be released. So we will be able to share that uh, data. But um, as expected, the neats and not knowns numbers have gone down. Okay, thank you. That's, that's very, very reassuring. Um, I've also, there's a question about the virtual school working closely with the Prince's Trust to provide bespoke NEAT programmes. Um, can, can you just out, outline, explain that a little bit more, what that involves? Um, I don't have much of the detail on that. Um, Georgie, you were involved in some of that. Yeah, so there's a range of um, re-engagement programmes that happen um, across the local area. So we work with a range of um, providers and stakeholders, um, the Prince's Trust being one of them. Um, there's a SPEAR programme um, that works um, out of one of our Bournemouth churches, um, which is um, a really good engagement programme as well. Um, we work with um, college. Um, obviously, um, our youth services are integral to the re-engagement work. So um, UP in BCP um, contribute to that work as well. So it really depends. The re-engagement work um, is obviously very personalised to the young person um, and what they want their, their next step to be. Um, we also um, work really closely, um, kind of embedded with within the um, the education improvement team, we have careers and enterprise um, colleagues. Um, so they are commissioned colleagues um, from um, the careers arm of the DfE um, and they um, work um, with us um, on a range of neat projects um, as well. Um, and quite often businesses are involved in those in those projects. So it really depends. Um, they, what tends to happen is the the young person is is contacted um, by by the youth teams. Um, there's um, mentoring, coaching work that takes place. Um, often there's work with regard to um, looking at you know what employment or education or training offer the young person is looking at. Um, there can also be wraparound support for the young person. So whether that's to do with um, housing difficulties um, or emotional health, um, well-being issues. Um, so really looking at the whole person and then moving forward so that young person will re-engage um, into either education, um, employment or training. Um, so um, one of the um, pieces of work is also thinking about some of those um, perhaps kind of short-term programmes. So some of the things like Prince's Trust, they run over um, perhaps a, a term um, or a couple terms. And then it's the it's the kind of what next. So it's making sure that they then have um, something else to go on to, um, whether that's an apprenticeship or back into education um, um, or into a traineeship, for example. So um, lots of work that, that takes place. There's some really good examples of work that's, that's happening with young people. I think probably... Um, the thing to say is the trick is to to make sure young people don't become neat in the first place. It's really much harder to re-engage a young person um, than it is to support them when they're already in education and training. Um, and so that's why um, when I mentioned about retention rates um, in our sixth form colleges, that needs to be a real area of focus for us. We need to make sure that, that young people don't end up um, kind of leaving education um, and not having anything to go to. Um, it's it's much, much easier if we can make sure we're working with them um, before they leave um, kind of education, employment or training. 
Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Um, Dylan, do you have a question? Yeah, um, it was uh, just on page, um, oh, what page have I lost it? I think I've lost it. Oh, no, I've got it. Page 161, um, summary of equality applications. Um, I think it's point 12. Um, it's talking about um, children and young people who are disadvantaged or vulnerable um, or have ad additional needs and have bone heritage could be disproportionately affected by permanent exclusions. It's been a bit of a feature of overview and scrutiny as we talked about permanent exclusions and the implications they have. Um, I was just wondering, is there any work in place um, to combat it um, around, around the BAME community? Um, or is it a systemic, cash, a systemic issue within schools um, uh, or the exclusion process? So, th thank you, Dylan. Um, so, Roman is trying to reduce exclusions across the whole school cohort at the moment. Um, there is a, an overrepresentation of BAME pupils in our exclusion data, um, but our whole um, the exclusion data for all children um, is is too high. Um, so, the Education Entitlement Board that you heard about um, uh, earlier on is is sort of our, our first step in in um ensuring there's that sort of consistent approach um across the school system thank you lisa thank you um i was looking at page 164 um and it's the um the road says social care percentage of children in care with attendance at a good or outstanding school. Um, and then in the comment, I thought that was about children. Um, yeah. um, children should be um, enrolled at a good or outstanding school, but this seems to be talking about whether or not they have good attendance. Um, so I didn't know which is which, which, you, which it's meant to be measuring. Yeah. Can you just um, confirm the page number? Sorry, because uh, it's one six four. Um, but then I I did have a because it says that some of this is regarding U.S. children, and I um, I wondered whether or not the college course that they do at Bournemouth Paul College, how uh, I've looked at the rating from Ofsted, but it's it's a big college and there's a lot a lot that they're um, assessing there and it hasn't been looked at for quite some time I did it doesn't look like it's ever been looked at in detail that particular course and I wondered if it is how do we know that's a good course because they're one group of children who don't have a choice whereas most um, children can change schools this this is just the only provision for the for this group um, so I wondered what the feeling is about um, without criticising the staff who work with us, who work really hard, I know, but um, whether or not this is a good provision or not, how do we know? Thank you. So, so there's two questions there. So mm -hmm. first of all, uh, 64, that, that is, you're right, the percentage of children in care um, with um, who are attending a good and outstanding school. Um, so as, as we said earlier, there will be some children in care who will be attending a school without an Ofsted rating or an inadequate judgment or requires improvement, um, sorry, right, requires improvement rather, um, because they were at that school and might have then subsequently come into care and we would look at the reasons for, for moving them and not moving them. Um, so in terms of the UASC course at the college, um, and Georgia, you, you might want to come in there, um, it's a good question. The, the, the college have been really supportive in offering, um, we've just been in touch with them recently to offer um, uh, ESOL courses, um, which Georgie will tell us what that stands for, because I always forget. I always say English is an additional language. Additional it's, language. It's, it's, English. It's, it's, it's the non-English non speaking, learning English. But they Thank keep you. changing the acronym. And we're not meant to use acronyms, so, uh, we're, not, so, yes, so yeah. we're just explain it. <laughs> but, yeah, the college have been really supportive in, in putting that course on. Um, and I'll hand over to you in a second, um, Georgie. But just to say that actually um, we, we are in early conversations about how we... Um, uh, 
how we sort of oversee the education of our USCs, of our um, unaccompanied asylum seeking children, um, because our schools um, have been um, very supportive, but it's we're looking at actually how do we um, sort of check that they're receiving the right levels of education. Um, Georgie, did you want to comment on the course in particular? Um, I was just going to make a comment around, um, I suppose, the improvement journey that Bournemouth and Paul have, have been on. And, and, and I know you mentioned initially around um, the Ofsted Good rating um, and, you know, certainly um, the the level of provision at the college. We're, you know, we're really um, proud of partnership working with the college, um, the, the level of applied courses, vocational courses, the range of courses and also key staff um, across the college. So, um, you know, it, it is um, a, a really good partnership with the college and we really, you know, we do need the college to be really strong partners with us. Um, and I think that we see that across the area with, um, you know, engagement with their SEND teams, engagement um, with their welfare teams, engagement with regard to the skills agenda, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, you know, they, they've very much been on that improvement journey um, and, you um, you know, it, it's um, an exciting time for the college with lots of things coming on stream. And then, as you say, looking down onto that granular level of of, of what the challenges are um, at subject levels. Um, but, you know, we would be be confident that there's, you know, really strong leadership and management across the college um, to really have that oversight as well. Does that, uh, does that answer, Lisa? Um. Um, I think I think sort of there are some uh, things I've noticed about that particular course. One is that um, I think if a child came into care in usual circumstances, I think they would be in school within days. Whereas the the way that that course does run, it, it can be um, weeks or months before they are able to enrol. Um, so there's things like that that I think. Uh, you know, when we apply, is this good enough? Would this be good enough for our own children? You know, um, they're having a different level of expectation of their education. And I think um, I, I would be interested in chatting to whoever is talking to the college and giving some feedback if that was possible, I think. Yes, yeah, start start times for college courses, or in fact, all six on courses, a real, a real challenge. Um, um so post 16 funding is is really complex and and quite often we we will say to the college have you got any start points that are not at the start of terms can, you know is there anything we can do on rolling programs etc cetera, etc cetera? um and it is a challenge because of how the funding comes down and how you register students and also obviously we you know we we've talked around our own um challenges with regard to staffing and recruitment and obviously um, you need staff to be able to teach those courses and, and there's an infinite amount of staff, especially around um, being able to teach young people where English is, is not necessarily um, their first language. So there's lots of um, challenges there. Going back to that neat conversation, one of the things that we've looked at is how can we use some of our other providers around coaching, mentoring, supporting um, to engage that young person. So if there is a bit of a delay before that young person can can start at a college, there is actually kind of other support that can be put in place. Um, and as I say, I, um, um, I mentioned the Sphere programme earlier. Um, I know um, we mentioned Prince's Trust as well. So some of that's where some of those courses can can come online as well to support the young people. Um, so there is a real willingness from the college to to be flexible with start times, um, but that that can come down, you know, sometimes to unfortunately um, just being able to to staff those courses and also how the funding comes down into the system as well. Right. Thank you. That's a. Um, I'm thinking we 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 we'll probably finish on that one. So, so I can just uh, sum up on on this. Um, so we, we've had a discussion about school with no Ofsted rating and, and why that is, um, and, and how it affects our figures. Um, the 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 neat numbers has have come up a couple of times, and um, and particularly the. Uh, yeah, the neat numbers are virtual school working with Princess Trust and other outside organisations. Um, we've looked at disadvantaged young people 
um, and exclusion, and particularly the high rated uh, BAME um, in, in permit exclusions. Um, we've looked at the, the century of good and outstanding schools, um, um, and, and we've cleared up the, the attendance, um, or what that actually meant. Um, the, um, the ESOL I've got written down here, but English is an is a, is a, is a indigenous language. Um, acronyms is a foreign language to us, as we know. Um, and the funding of the college and how that affects um, those particular courses. And I, th I think that, that covers what we talked about. Um, in that case, we're, we're on to um, item 12, uh, portfolio holders update. Uh, now, um, I, I see Mike's just uh, turned his camera on. Um, I have got an update here for, from Nicola as well, but I was rather hoping you'd go first, Mike, because uh, uh, I got to read Nicola's out. Um, so uh, give me a rest while well, 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 you do a little bit. So uh, over to you for a moment, Mike. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Richard. A few brief comments from me. I mean, you guys have been through an awful lot of data this evening, so I'm not going to go through any of that. I'm just going to make you know, one or two brief comments. Two recent events that were very successful. We had an awards event for children in care and care leavers uh, towards the end of October in the Bournemouth Hilton. Big thank you to all of you who attended. Another event that was very successful was the official opening of our care leavers hub in central Bournemouth again at the end of October. That, if you don't know, it is a drop in centre for our care leavers. And I think most of you will probably have seen that this was this won the best project.